Hey everybody, this week we have Yoan Grillo on the show, a cartel investigative reporter. He reports on the Sinaloa cartel. We cover all kinds of cartel stuff in this one to include the exchange that just went down between the Sinaloa cartel and El Chapo's son. The Mexican government gave up El Chapo's son to the Sinaloa cartel because the Sinaloa cartel overpowered the Mexican government. We talk all about it. Hey guys, thank you all for being here. I love you all. If you haven't noticed, last week we hit 1 million subscribers. And I just want to say thank you to all of you. That means the world to us. I never thought I would have a million people that want to watch the content I'm producing, but we do. So thank you. And if you're feeling generous, I could always use a uh, iTunes and Spotify review. So if you don't mind, head over to iTunes and Spotify, leave us a review. We'd really appreciate it. And for that exclusive content, sign up for the Vigilance Elite Sean Ryan Show newsletter. You won't be disappointed. All right, love you. Let's get to the show. One last thing I forgot to say, please like, comment, subscribe. And if you get anything out of these shows, please share it with your friends. Let's make this thing go viral. Yoan Grillo, welcome to the show, man. Good to be here, Sean. Been tracking you for a long time. It's really, really, it's just awesome to have you sitting across from me. And uh, with all this stuff going on in Mexico right now, we have a ton to cover. So, award-winning investigative journalist, you've produced, directed several documentaries, docu-series, you're an author very well established in the cartel Mexico space and uh yeah it's just an honor to have you here so I'm, I'm super excited thanks much for the invite yeah great to talk my pleasure uh everybody starts off with a gift and I'm out of boxes Ooh. so those are the best gummy bears in the world Vigilance League gummy bears and uh, they don't they don't even have any THC in it, believe it or not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but so I can take these on the plane when you, I fly back to Mexico. You can take those on the plane yeah. when you go back to Mexico and you won't have to worry about getting arrested. <laughs> <Okay>. So yeah. <laughs> but um, man, tons of stuff going on in Mexico right now. So if you don't mind, I'm just gonna get the audience up to date on some of the stuff that's going on and then uh, I figure this is a great place to start. So at 0400 hours on January 5th, 35 miles north of the capital near a rural fishing community called Jesus Maria, security forces claim they had spotted a convoy of around 25 cartel vehicles in which their target, a.k.a. El Raton, does that mean the rat? The mouse. The mouse was believed to be traveling. <clears throat> Defense Secretary Luis Crencioso Sandoval said cartel gunmen opened fire on troops with half a dozen 50 gallon machine gun trucks. The Army responded with UH-60 gunships on the cartel convoy. The cartel opened fire, forcing two aircraft to land with significant damage, but somehow Guzman was captured. The cartel then closed in on Culiacan International Airport to prevent his transport to Mexico City and a civilian airliner was struck by gunfire. 
but nobody was hurt. In all, 10 military personnel, 19 cartel members were killed in the initial clash. The running shootouts also killed one Kulakan policeman and wounded 17 police officers and 35 military personnel. You know, so then let's fast forward a minute, and this is, I want to ask you your opinion on this. On January 9th, President Joe Biden arrives in Mexico ahead of bilateral meetings with Mexican President Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, as well as a joint gathering of the three North American leaders dubbed the Three Amigos Summit, the first time Mexico has hosted a U.S. president since 2014. What strikes me a little odd about this is in 2019, they captured El Raton, Again, and <clears throat> after hundreds of, arc, of cartel henchmen overwhelmed security corpses in Kula Khan, they released them. <laughs> so, do you think, what, one, why would they go after the guy again, knowing that the Sinaloa cartel is obviously going to show some type of military force and take action, knowing what they did last time, which is just release them back to the Sinaloa cartel, that's exactly what they did this time, again, what, three years Three years later? Do you think that was a distraction by chance for the, for the Three Amigos Summit that just happened down there with Biden, Trudeau, and the Prime Minister of uh, Mexico? This episode is sponsored by HVMN, and HVMN is one of those supplements that I wish I would have had back when I was an active duty SEAL is it's like taking a shot of energy before you need to do something that's going to require a lot of energy. Like now, I use it before I go to the gym, but it's not an energy drink. It's like a feeling of being in the zone. I don't feel hyper jittery, anxiety, stuff like I get when I drink too much coffee. Ketone IQ comes in portable, convenient shots. They're great for cycling, long runs, all kinds of workouts, and can help you stay sharper on a regular basis. Again, it's not an energy drink. It's not full of a bunch of stimulants. You could get better endurance, you don't get the crash, and it could help curb the appetite at least a little bit. Definitely a unique opportunity here in offering my audience 20% off your order of Ketone IQ. You can find Ketone IQ at hvmn.com and use promo Sean at checkout to save 20% plus. If you subscribe, you can save even more. This stuff is great for daily use. Use promo code Sean. Again, that's hvmn.com, promo code Sean to save 20% off Ketone IQ. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can do great things, but sometimes life gets you bogged down and you may feel overwhelmed or like you aren't showing up the way you want to. Working with a BetterHelp therapist can help get you closer to the best version of you because when you feel empowered, you're more empowered to take on everything life throws at you. And we can all use more empowerment. If you've been considering therapy, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a quick questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And if you don't feel the therapist you're matched with is a great fit, then you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Sean today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Sean. Yeah, so it's a lot to unpack, and it's, it's a big story in, in a whole bunch of ways. So in 2019, you had this military anti-narcotics unit go for Billy Douglas man, son of El Chapo, on one of four brothers, four of the sons of El Chapo. He's got a whole bunch of kids, but there's four sons known as Los Chapitos, who run a faction of the Sinaloa cartel, which is very big, very effective in trafficking fentanyl uh, to the United States, crystal meth, you know, big players. So in 2019, you have, on based on a U.S. extradition order, a U.S. indictment from New York, you have a military anti-narcotics unit goes in there, 
into a luxury house in the city of Culiacán. And they make the arrest then around, or they go in there around midday. Now, at that point, you start to have uh, these uh, reactions from the sicarios, the hitmen of the Sinaloa cartel, of the brothers. And the military unit is pinned down in the house. So then you get it, it escalates and you get 700 cartel gunmen against about 350 soldiers. Wow. And they, they also, they, they, they go into the barracks where the military families are, start where the wives and children are, and they're like running, and they're actually taking fire. They start picking up some officers, saying we're going to kill them. Uh, they're, they're, you know, people are, civilians are like, you know, like terrified. People are stuck inside schools where they went to pick up their kids. They're like sheltered in the schools while this stuff's taking place. So then the government at 6 p.m. gave the order to release Obidio Guzman under pressure. Now... It was interesting that, you know, he took a lot of, obviously a lot of flack for that. Uh, people always cited this as the reason why he's weak or corrupt or both, President Lopez Obrador. Um, in one personal meeting with him, I, I, I heard about from a witness there, he said the thing that he most regretted, was most kind of annoyed about in his presidency was that, in fact, releasing Obidigo's man on that day. So I see this as being like an attempt to kill the demons of what happened in 2019. It's known in Mexico as El Culicanazo, this whole event. So this time, it was a much more sleekly planned military operation. They didn't get him in Culiacán, they got him in this village of Jesus Maria. Now, what you read out was the government's official version. Okay. But there's definitely holes in that. It wasn't, it looks like they just kind of ran into this guy you know, driving in a vehicle. They said that maybe for certain judicial reasons, they didn't have the full judicial clearance for the operation for certain reasons. It might be the, the, the why. But they went in there, um, went into this village, Jesus Maria, where he had a house, went in there, took him out in the early hours of the morning, got him on the plane to Mexico City. Now, when the cartel reacted, and they reacted again, uh, and started blockading the street. But then the, the military were much more prepared. It wasn't 350 soldiers this time. It was 3,500 soldiers against them. So they, 10 times the amount of soldiers were ready to react to this. Wow. So they outnumbered the cartel sicarios. That number of dead, 17 cartel sicarios, cartel hitmen dead, it might be a lot higher really because often the cartel would take away the bodies of those who are killed. They don't want them being taken by the military. Okay. They take away their own bodies in many sense. cases. So it could be a lot higher. And they got him on a plane to Mexico City and then they got him. Now, the timing of the Biden visit, I mean, I don't think this, it's hard to believe it's a coincidence. When Biden goes down there and Biden is under pressure to ask the president of Mexico, why are we capturing so much fentanyl on the US-Mexico border? Mm -hmm. Why is this happening? So now... You know, President Lopez Obrador can say, well, at least we're fighting these guys. At least, you know, we got this guy, Bidio Guzman. Um, we lost 10 soldiers in this fight. So he's got an answer. So as soon as, you know, he knows this president visit is happening, they're like, make this capture before then. Funnily enough, the village, Jesus Maria, he had a house there. They say that there's the military were like looking at this for six months or something, kind of building up this operation. So maybe he was kind of... But funny enough, there's a song called Soy el Raton. Uh, it was called a narco corrido or drug ballad about this guy. And it mentions the name of the village in the song. <laughs> and it says that's where he grew up. So it's kind of like, as soon as I heard, like when in the, in the morning when I heard like, okay, there's military operation in Jesus Maria, I was like, Obidio Guzman, El Raton. That's from the song, you know, so right away it was kind of getting ready. Okay, maybe they've caught this guy now. Wow. Do you, um, so you don't think this was necessarily a distraction? You think this was just to get give Trudeau and Biden an answer saying, look, this is what we're doing about it. We just did this operation four days before you guys got here. Yeah, I, th I, th I, think, I think it's like when you sit down, uh, it, if you look historically, this happens. When Mexican presidents meet American presidents, and drug issue comes up. They're like, give me something to answer. Okay. Why do you think 
Is 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 a capture kill not? Is that not something they do in Mexico? I'm just curious why they wouldn't have had a capture kill mission or just a kill mission, knowing what happened, you know, three years prior to this. So during the presidency of Felipe Calderon, you saw a lot of kills. The Mexican military would go in there, both the Marines and the military. So you see some of the big drug traffickers there. Now, some of them would be themselves be answering with gunfire. Uh, but there's a guy called Arturo Beltran Leva, a very interesting case. Uh, if you want to look up this guy, Arturo Beltran Leva, massive drug trafficker. He was shot dead by Mexican Marines. I'll tell you a crazy story about that. But other, other ones, Nacho Coronel, huge trafficker, Tony Tormenta. And there was big gunfights. There was one gunfight in Tamaulipas State when they took out Tony Tormenta. Six Marines died, 300 grenades thrown in that gun battle. Journalist was killed in the fire. In when Arturo Beltran Level was taken down on DEA information. So the DEA got the information, gave it to the Marines, paid apparently $5 million for this information. Where they got the house where it's going to be in Cuenabaca. And the Marines went in there, a uh, bunch of gunfire, a, a, a baby was killed, civilians were killed in the crossfire. One of the Marines died. And uh, Felipe Calderon, the president, gave him this hero's funeral to the Marine who died. Afterwards, some gunmen went to the wake of the Marine in his hometown and murdered the mother, the sister, and the aunt. Like massacred family members in revenge. So you see, sometimes these kill missions, what the stakes can be with these kill missions. Um, You saw afterwards, after the Felipe Calderon, you started to see the Peña Nieto administration, you saw more captures, less kills, and more more captures. So I think think it was kind of a, a, a strategy to try and dial it down a bit. Now, you still got 10 soldiers being killed in this. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, but it's the rules of engagement in in Mexico. I think are very unclear, and you know, you've got a situation where the Mexican government is not declaring we've got an armed conflict here. We've got like an insurgency or an armed conflict mm-hmm. for various reasons. You know, they don't. That's not good for tourism. That's not good. I, mean, like, I think cats out of the bag by now. But yeah, yeah. Even so, but like, like if you say, if you say like. I mean, this gets into like you know international legal grounds. But if they start saying we're, we're actually dealing with an insurgency, like um, you know, like Syria or something, um, what rights does that give the people you capture? Does that you know what rights does that give like certain they're a specific arm? You're naming them as a specific specific armed group. Um, what does that tell you about foreign investment? So the Mexican government plays a game where they're like a bit like. Um, because I, you know, I wrote my, the, the subtitle of my first book was uh, "Inside Mexico's Criminal Insurgency." El narco. So, and so I, I, you know, I started looking at this. You know, they're acting like a guerrilla group. You know, they're shooting down. Um, I mean, it's happened after that. That first book came out, but then they shot down a military helicopter with an RPG seven. Um, they're, you know, putting up seven hundred gunmen against three hundred fifty soldiers. This is acting like an insurgent group, but they're gangsters. You know, it just. It just... I understand what you're saying about, you know, they don't want the family members to be killed. But to me, there's a very simple solution, and that's use a special operations surgical team to do the hit and then don't hand out any awards, at least publicly. Mm. And then they wouldn't know who to go after or or they would. I'm sure they would pick somebody, but it wouldn't be, you know, the operational team that that made the hit. So, I mean. Again, going back to where the, where Mexican government stands legally, if they if they say declare we've got an insurgency and soldiers have got the right to go and shoot down the enemy, because that's what you know you can do in an insurgency. You can say we're fighting a war, we're fighting a military war. Um, but Mexican government's not doing that. They're saying we've got a problem of gangsters and criminals. Mm-hmm. So the government can't legally give a, a go in to shoot you know, target order. I mean, the soldiers are carrying out 
a police operation still of arresting a gangster. So if you look, so again, like that's why they, I mean, the, the, this, it's all it's all a mess. And this, this situation is a, is a mess. I'm not uh, saying they should or shouldn't do this. I'm just saying like the kind of legal shit show this is. Okay. Um, that's why they kind of started lying about some of this. Oh, we just ran into this guy in a Jeep convoy because they hadn't really got the whole judicial clearance for exactly for this whole operation. During the Felipe Calderon administration, some of this stuff looked like they had gone in there just to assassinate these guys. They kind of got in there, we're going to go in there, we're going to shoot them. All these guys start, you know, as soon as these guys start responding with fire, obviously they can go in there and shoot them. But they can't just legally say, we're going to go in there and have an assassination operation of these guys. Now, you know, like, obviously they're, you know, Mexico's living a hellish cartel problem. Mm-hmm. And, you know, would that make a, you know, are you eventually going to get a government that does that? You know, you eventually get government says we're going to just declare these guys as terrorists or insurgents and just take them out. You know, who knows in the future? Do, right. do you think that might happen? Uh, do you think that they are an insurgency and not just street gangs? Right. At this so point? I think obviously they're beyond street gangs. Uh, I think in some ways we don't have like the the, 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 the the clear language to describe them. So like, you know, I said criminal insurgency. I made this comparison in my first book. I used the word gangster warlords and, 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 and you know, analyze this looking at all these different groups around Latin America. Um, they're, yeah, they're clearly beyond criminals and what we can understand as a criminal problem and clearly more comparable to like insurgent groups. But there are differences between Mexico and say, uh, Al Qaeda, say the Islamic State, and these kind of things. When you go to these territories that the cartels control, it's not like, say, the Islamic State controls a territory and they're interested in things like uh, changing the schools and having Islamic indoctrination. And they're like controlling really the, the whole territory. No one can come in and out of that territory. In Mexico, it's different. Even in the most cartel areas, and I've been to the village of Chapa Guzman, I've been to every state in Mexico over the years and been to, you know, the, the, the countryside in Michoacán, in Tamaulipas, in the cities, in Juarez, in all these places, over, and seen them involved over the last 20 years. In the places, even the most cartel places, they still allow the government to operate and do certain things. They still allow school teachers to come in. I don't care what the school teachers are teaching. You know, they're not interested in like indoctrinating people with some new ideology like the Islamic State or the Shining Path in Peru, which is a communist, you know, Marxist insurgency there. Um, they want the government to provide electricity. They want the government to send garbage trucks to collect garbage. But they want to control certain aspects of that territory. So they control security and control the territory in that sense. Now you get what's called halcones or like lookouts. Some areas, they're really obvious. Like when you go to that area of Chapa Guzman's village, you drive in and you see these guys there, give him a nod. This guy there with a the gun and a radio. You know, give him, give him a nod, you know, you know that. These guys are ri- riding around. <laughs> you know, funny story, I was riding around one of the, this is more in the Maya Zambada territory in the south of Culiacan. I oh, spent a lot of time there the last uh, year filming a documentary series. And one time I was stuck in the mud in a car there, I was like, stuck in the mud. This kind of minivan drives up behind me. I think, oh, someone can help me out. I look in, uh, it's a bunch of guys with AK-47s, camo gear, a bunch of these cigarios. And I was like, oh, sorry, I'm in your way. I was like, we'll we'll drive past. The guy tries to drive past and they get stuck as well. Because like, you know, the, the vehicles are too tightly stuck together. And I'm like, like kind of you know, laughing, trying to, trying to you know, play this one out. And the guy, the guy there's kind of laughing as well, the head of these, this little crew of Sakaris, about 23 years old. Sakaris are like 18, 19. <clears throat> and then he said, and I said, look, I'm from England. I'm you know, filming a documentary here. It's a, it's a music theme about the, the local drug ballads. The guy gets on his radio, calls a pickup truck and gets, gets me pulled out of the mud. It shows a bit just the way they operate in these areas. They're kind of like the local authority, the local police in these areas, and they're not necessarily going to mess with everybody. 
Um, but they're kind of parallel. So they're like, they'll, they'll have the parallel to, to the police forces and the local mayor. They'll have the police forces on their payroll, often basically be ordering the local police around, have the local mayor on their payroll. Or the local mayor these days can be a, basically a cartel member. Um, so they have control of these areas, but, you know, entwined with the government. Uh, and it's not as simple as, you know, like, you know, you know, there, there are, you know, some ways, and you see the, you know, these times when they, when they react to a government operation, and they'll bring out 700 gunmen to confront the military. Um, but it, it, it's a complicated, weird situation. It's like, it's a weird 21st century uh, form of, of hybrid armed conflict, which is quite different from many things we've seen before. Interesting. So how, how much... <clears throat> How much of the federal government does the cartel control? They, it sounds like they have a really good handle on local government. Yeah. You know, and, and it sounds like, you know, maybe they don't overtly control everything, but it sounds like they're just allowing things to happen. Like they allow school to have session. They allow people to come in, you know, uh, to work these other government jobs, but they shut down all the anything that could possibly get in their way? Yeah, so it's a very good question. And, and again, it, it gets to a, a weird, complicated uh, level of corruption you have there and the way that the cartel power interact with the government in the state in Mexico. So you see th these cartels, which are, which are kind of changing and breaking up and moving all the time, um, but you also have corrupt officials and like corrupt generals who are like who can be working for the cartel or they can be making their own money and kind of in a way they're, they're kind of so you get a struggle between them trying to operate and shake down the cartels for money okay as well now if you go back to the Felipe Calderon administration which was very confrontational with drug cartels the public security secretary so the kind of top security official one of the top security officials in the country who was, you know, in some ways the public face, the kind of or the kind of architect of the, of the anti of the drug war. He is going to be in trial in the United States on drug trafficking charges, working with a cartel. So from that point of view, you got very high up. Now, presidents themselves, there's accusations um, of presidents themselves. Um, going back to the nineties, the president's brother Raúl Salinas accused of running the cartel operations. So from that point, you got, you got high up. Now, nowadays, though, you can see, well, you know, so he's an accusation, particularly after 2019, well, this president, you know, why did he order the release of this drug cartel guy? Is that the federal government captured? But then they capture him. At the same time, there's still, and getting to the fentanyl, you know, I went to, I went to the, uh, the port of Manzanillo, which is the biggest Pacific port, biggest port in Mexico. And it's the port which sits on the Pacific Ocean where the chemicals come in from China. They are coming in from China. From China and from India with the Chinese chemists are now also running labs in India as well. What are they doing in India? I mean, because, you know, they're, they're, it's a way that the, the same operations, the same groups can just go and set up a lab in India and it's less controlled in India than China. Although... Chinese government isn't isn't properly cracking down on this stuff. But anyway, talking about this port, so I went to this port to look at this, talk to people who work in the port, people who import stuff, export stuff. Now that port is now run by the Mexican Marines. Supposedly less corrupt. But the chemicals are still coming through there. And there's bribes taking place. So again, so that, I mean, you know, you've got a very questionable to be polite, very questionable federal apparatus as well. But there's also been this power struggle in Mexico for some years, I think, between the, like people trying to create a federal government that's above the cartels and the cartels literally kind of trying, you know, literally bossing around federal officials. And you've seen, I mean, you've seen federal officials assassinated. I remember when the, the same guy, Beltran Leva, they ordered after the, the guy's brother was taken, was arrested, a guy called El Mochomo was arrested and, and is now in prison in the United States here. The acting head of the federal police was assassinated in his house in Mexico City, in his home. 
But was he assassinated for being an honest cop or assassinated because he broke a deal that he'd taken money from this drug cartel? And then was like, you know, you, you went back on this deal. And that's often the, the kind of thing, you know, you took some money from us and then you went back on this deal. So we took you out. Damn. Do, the, do you know that for a fact with this guy? Uh, this, it looks very likely, but you, in terms of that, like that's a common thing you see by cartels. Into, like have the, the, these banners out. Mm -hmm. And a common thing they'll say is like, they'll have a, an official accused and they'll say, you took money from us, you know, you took money and you, and you went back on this deal. That's like a common complaint, an argument they have in those banners. Man, I don't see how they're going to get a handle on this. They're so intertwined with every piece of government in Mexico. I mean, is there anything that's that's that they're not tapped into? Is there any anything? Are they are they tapped into the president? Do you see? Are they tapped into the elections? Are they? So I mean, like, I mean, Mexico is a big and complicated country. So it's a country still of like uh, you know trillion dollar economy, hundred and thirty million people, thirty two states. So you still find states that are not cartel controlled. You know, I live in Mexico City. And in Mexico City, does not have cartel control in the same way that Sinaloa has, or the you know Juarez has, or the Tijuana has. In Mexico City, um, you have one of the biggest police forces in Latin America, uh, more than you know, more than a hundred thousand officers live in Mexico City Police Force. Okay. Um, they have this huge amount of cameras on the street now. There's the guy who's running the Mexico City Police Department who survived an attack by the Jalisco New Generation cartel. Garcia Hafuch, Omar Garcia Hafuch. And, and, and they, you know, I've been, been covering and following some of the stuff there. And I went to where there was, a, there was a, some gangsters in, in a place called Tepito, La Unión de Tepito. And I went down there and, and, and checked out and they had a yeah, very constant kind of police operations there. You know, I don't know, you know, totally, these guys are totally honest, but like they are hitting certain mobs hard. But interestingly, the murder rate in Mexico City halved between 2018 and 2022. And Mexico City, which or, the, or, the, or what's called the CDMX part of Mexico City, um, which is the kind of federal district, the kind of inner part, now has a lower murder rate than many US cities. And even Portland, Oregon. You had mentioned that last night. Yeah, yeah. Portland, Oregon, because it had a sudden increase in murders in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. So Mexico City, and, and like you tell me, well, actually, it's kind of crazy. Like, Portland, Oregon, you think it's got to be real safe. But definitely, I mean, quite substantially lower than some U.S. cities like Houston and Dallas and some of these U.S. cities. Not as low as New York, which is fairly low. So you get some things, we think, okay, well, that's, something's working there in Mexico City, at least. Whatever exactly is going on. And cartels in Mexico City are there. You know, you, you get arrested, these cartel operatives in Mexico City. But they don't operate and control the city in the same way that they control Sinaloa or Tamaulipas or Juarez. In Mexico City, they're kind of there and they're making deals and moving around, but they're not controlling the neighborhoods. So Mexico City is mixed. You've got some states um, like Yucatan, the state of Yucatan has a murder rate which is comparable to European countries. Okay. It's a fairly peaceful area. So you've got this, but then you, then you have got Zacatecas right now, which is a full-on war in Zacatecas between the Jalisco New Generation cartel and the Sinaloa cartel. And it's just, that's full-on crazy stuff. Um, so you've got this weird thing. I was down in uh, another, one of the other uh, points of the confrontations, the kind of cartel confrontations, is the border of Michoacán and Jalisco. There's a big fight there between the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, very violent organization, and a group of local gangsters known as Cartels United, they call themselves. One of the groups there called Los Viagras. <laughs> you <know>? Okay. <laughs> the, 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 the Viagras. Um, kind of cra and that's crazy. That looks more like re kind of weird hybrid warfare. Uh, and I went down there and they laid a bunch of landmines make kind of makeshift landmines and they they they'd hit one military um K 
carrier there, like a jeep, and they'd hit some farmers and killed the farmers and stuff. They'd laid, they'd, apparently the military had deactivated more than 250 landmines there. Where are they getting this? Where are they getting the landmines? Where are they getting the RPGs? Yeah, so, so different, different sources. So in terms of the weaponry, um, a lot of the grenades and the RPG-7s come from Central America. Now, they come from military stockpiles in Central America. The American government gave the El Salvadoran government a lot of grenades back in the 80s, fighting the, the wars then against some guerrillas, left-wing guerrillas, communist guerrillas in, in, uh, in, in El Salvador. There was huge stockpiles of grenades, and they started leaking and going to these criminal black markets. In Honduras, you had these, a bunch of these RPG-7s, rocket pro grenade launchers, stolen from uh, the Honduran military. Now, the regular AK-47s or AR-15s they're buying in the United States and the 50 cals. They generally buy on those, and the amount they'll pay, or they were paying, the biggest method is through straw buyers, through paying people with clean records to buy the guns. And they'll pay things like $50 for pistols to straw buyers, $100 for AK-47s or AR-15s, and $500 for the 50 cals. And that's a lot of the rates they'll pay here for buying them here, and, and, and that's where the, the, the biggest amount of those guns are coming down. Do, the, do you think these people that are buying them, the guns, know where they're going? I think some of them do, yeah. I think do some you? of them do. I think, uh, I mean, some of them are, are, are like, I mean, they're cartel affiliates. You look at some of these cases. Friends, if you don't trust the government to protect you, then you probably already have an emergency food supply. But if you don't or want a bigger stockpile, now is the time to get some. My Patriot Supply is offering a new lower price on their popular three-month emergency food kit. This food is what you need to have on hand in the coming months. When the supply chain breaks down and all you have is a week's worth of food, you'll wish you'd grab this food ahead of time. So grab it now and save $200 on each kit you need. Go to MyPatriotSupply.com to get this discount and make sure your family is well-fed if the worst-case scenario ever happens. Each three-month emergency food kit comes packed with delicious breakfast, lunches, dinners, drinks, and snacks. Get at least one kit per person so you have plenty for all. Your family will love this food, and you'll be the hero who got it. Go to MyPatriotSupply.com and save $200 per kit. Act now. You won't regret it. MyPatriotSupply.com. The case of Fast and Furious is obviously an interesting one, um, which I think a lot of people will be aware of, the case of Fast and Furious, uh, going back to, from 2009 to 2011, when there was cartel operatives Buying, they bought more than 2,000 guns in Arizona and the ATF was watching them and not acting. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting, that case is now very, very documented, so you've got a lot of files on that. Uh, and I looked at that. I talked to one of the uh, uh, confidential informants, a gun seller in the pre-operation called Wide Receiver, uh, a guy from Arizona, um, was, was even before they did the Fast and Furious and, and looked heavily at that case. Um, which is yeah, which is a mess. I interviewed Philippe, the former president of Mexico, Felipe Calderon, specifically about that case as well. Uh, and uh, and that's you know it's uh, you know uh, you know a very messy case. Which but uh, but you look at that, you look at that, you, you know you had cartel operatives, they knew. They were, I mean, yeah, one guy went around different gun shops and spent half a million dollars on different guns for the cartels. He he, he knew what. what to do. Now there's some cases that people you know they can get acquire guns in many places across the country. There was a case of a guy who was an Iraq war veteran who bought 10 AK-47s for the Setters Cartel in, uh, before, and one of those guns was used in, by the mob who shot and killed an American agent. Oh, man. In Mexico. Jaime Zapata. It was, they bought 10, and they were Romanian AK-47s, I went to the factory, uh, Kujia factory in Romania, where they was made to trace this, this whole process there. Uh, but they went into a pawn shop, and he was paid six hundred dollars for the ten guns, so six hundred bucks. 
Um, one of those guys was used to kill an American agent for ICE, Jaime Zapata, who was shot dead in 2011. And his uh, colleague, his partner there, uh, Victor Avila, survived that shooting. He's now a very active speaker about these issues. Uh, and about I'm aware of issues. Yeah, Victor Avila, yeah. What, did anything happen to the war vet that bought the AKs? Probation. Probation, that's yeah. it. Probation, yeah. Because the crime of that was lying on the form. Now, if you look at some of the, the interesting politics around this stuff, if you were to declare cartels terrorist groups, which some people want to do in the United States, and there's an argument for this, but if you were to declare the cartels terrorist groups, that crime would have gone from lying on the form to acquiring material for a terrorist organization. Yeah. That could have gone from probation to 25 years. But obviously there's certain people in the, in the gun industry that don't want that as well, because then if you run a gun store and you sell a gun, store, you sell gun to a straw purchaser, you know, could you suddenly be, be caught up in that, in that sting as well? The other thing about declaring cartels as terrorist groups, and there's, you know, there's certainly an argument for this, you know, for these tactics they're using to declare them as terrorist organizations, um, was if, then if the people are applying for asylum in the United States and saying, I'm fleeing this cartel, they threaten me, and then they're declared by the US government as a terrorist organization, that would increase their case in going to court in the United States. That makes a lot of sense. Do you but think then they could hit them very hard in certain ways, you know, to declare them terrorist groups. Yeah. What do you think they should do? Do you think they should label them a terrorist group? Uh, um, like in, in the United States, um, you know, I've been covering this stuff for 21 years uh, or 22 years I've been in Mexico now. Uh, and I used to have some kind of easy answers for this stuff and say this, this, is, this is what we do, three things. Um, right now I don't see, see easy solutions to this uh, I, I would say I, I don't know if, if, if labelling I mean I, there's different aspects if you, if you label them terrorist if, if, the, if the United States labelled these groups terrorist organisations but still if the United States you know could go in there with, with drone strikes or you know military raids uh, it's still not going to solve this because these groups are so powerful and so many people so you've basically got, there's this kind of three things that I look at, of, 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 you know, whether they do or not, and I'm not saying it's, a, it's an outrageous thing to do to name them as terrorist groups, but there's three things um, that I look at as, as kind of a solution to this, or as kind of long term. So one of them is you have to build up some law enforcement which works in Mexico. Uh, now, when you're dealing with cartels that are this heavily armed, it's extremely hard, but it's got to be, I mean, I don't see any other way. You've got to have law enforcement bodies and, and like, you know, like trying to push this back. And there's some of this is like, like we're doing in Mexico City, trying to say we've got to lower the murder rate in these areas. We can't allow armed groups to operate. We can't allow kind of blatant impunity. So some of it's about building some body of law enforcement. Now they have to maybe, you know, like say, well, we've got to accept that we're dealing with heavily armed groups and you've got to have a certain rule of engagement for that. But you need some law enforcement in Mexico. The second thing, and I, you know, I believe this does really work. I've spent a lot of time interviewing cartel members mm -hmm. over the last 22 years. A lot of the hitmen, some of the higher ups. If you look at the hitmen, then they're often recruited into the cartels when they're about 12 years old. There's different stories, you know, you, you find a bunch of different stories. Uh, but these are kind of typical stories. You have some of these neighborhoods, say in Juarez, Tamaulipas, the kids will be on the block and the cartels will approach them and recruit them 12 years old, 13 years old, and start off like, okay, you're going to be a lookout for us. And we're going to pay you 30 bucks a week. And we're going to give you a radio. Uh, or, or, or a cell phone, and you're going to send a message every time whatever comes past. And you hear, you hear these guys, how conscious you hear these guys signal where they're talking. Uh, one time I was with, with, the, with the police in Monterrey, and we were listening in to the Halcones, and they were talking about us. We were listening into them spying on us. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, know you, you, you've done plenty of that stuff. 
But anyway, so these kids, uh, the, the 12 years old, they get recruited as lookouts, they start taking money from the cartel, and they start getting trained to become hitmen. Some of them will carry out murders, 14, 15 years old. There was one guy who was a police officer who was also working with, with cartels. And he was describing how he would get the kids to cut up the bodies to start making them you know, lose their fear, become brutal. Interviewed another guy for the Barrio Azteca, which is a faction of the, of the Juarez cartel, who described how he looked for the kids. He would want to find kids who are like, got some hate in their heart. I don't want kids who are like, got nice families. It's kind of the opposite of the, you know, oh, I'm not sure exactly military recruitment, but like these guys are, are like looking, how do we, they're good, they need constant recruitment. We want to find guys who are messed up. And you, and you interview some of these scarios, you know, one guy, I talked to who was abandoned as a kid. His parents um, you know, left him with nothing and he was like, I got hate for the world. So like for me, the cartel gives me something and I, and I, don't, I, I, wanna, I wanna hurt other people. I don't care. I want something for myself. But then you get kids in like carrying out multiple murders. So now once you get somebody who's you know, 18, they carry out multiple murders, they cut up bodies, they've done decapitations, they're, they're, you can't do much for that. But you do need help and strategies to reach some of these kids before they get recruited by the cartel. Very specific focused programs. Mm. I mean, not just throwing money out there, but like very specific focused programs in the neighborhoods where the kids are being recruited. And you know, one guy I was talking to is like, yeah, we know on the block who are the kids who are gonna be recruited by the cartel. We know who the 10 kids are. You know, they, it's just waiting for it to happen. Why is the government doing nothing to try and do that? So that's another thing. I mean, it's kind of crime prevention or like changing this. So you're, you're talking about p implementing some kind of an educational service for for kids in these, I think in you these need, states, territories. Yeah, I mean, more focused. I mean, it's, it's like about, like, say, look very strategically, where's the high recruitment for these cartels? And then who specifically are the kids? And then, like, saying, talking to the parents. You know, your kid's going to get, it's going to be in a cartel with the next, you know, we can offer something, keep them in school, like um, offer something to try and like improve, learn a trade, learn something to have a living. Because think, you know, your kid's going to be dead. Could well be dead. I mean, you, how, how, how many of these kids have parents who are generational cartel members? Though this isn't a new problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, you've that, been down there for twenty-two yeah. years. If somebody got recruited at twelve, they could have. They, you know. I mean, it, it's this. It's a sad thing. Like. Um, well, remember, I was covering the stuff in 2004 big, when it kind of kind of started escalating, turf war there. And the kids there were not even born who are now hitmen. There, there's, a, there's, a grave, there's a graveyard in Sinaloa called the Omaya Cemetery. Amazing. If you ever get a chance to go down there, it's one of the most surreal, crazy graveyards in the world. Massive mausoleums for these big traffickers. But there's loads of graves of hitmen and you see loads of graves of kids, 18, 19, 20, 21. And, you know, you see, um, some of them are young fathers, and you'll see like on like Father's Day, I remember when I was on there, Father's Day one time, all these big balloons and blankets and everything like that. But also like, uh, sometimes the mothers will go down there and they'll, they'll have photographs. And, you know, how many of these kids are gonna die that young? I mean, think about it. In Mexico, there's been, over the last 10 years, more than 300,000 bodies. Like, you know, and it's going on 20 years, it's, you know, half a million. It's like, you know, there's a lot of, the, you know, these people are going to die. So, so how can you reach and try and stop, say, like, the new generation? I mean, yeah, you say, like, some of them are, are, are like, more generation cartel members, but then you talk to some of the, even the cartel members. One of the one of the things that I approach when I, when I meet a lot of these guys and you give a pitch, oh, and I want to talk to you. And I often say, well, like, you know, and this is, you know, partly journalistic spiel, or you're trying to meet somebody and you want to get talk to them. But it's just, you know, I say this from my heart. You know, I know you, you don't necessarily want this for your kids. You don't want your kids to live a life you liked. You know, you have the kind of glamour of, of like seeing like Narcos TV series and beautiful women and these big mansions, but most of them are not living like that. You know, that's, you know, the bosses, mm -hmm. but most of them, you know, they're living violent, brutal lives and they're going to be dead or in prison. They're going to be committing murders. You talk to them like, okay, you know, how do you feel about it? you know they they can you know, these guys? One guy interviewed him in prison in Ciudad Juarez. In the prison in Ciudad Juarez, where there's in fact also a 
they, they did a raid on it this January as well and they bust out a bunch of guys and killed 10 guards. One of my craziest prisons in the world. I was in there some years back and they have the, basically these wings which are segregated by cartel groups. So they have the Juarez cartel which has the Barrio Azteca in one part and they have the Sinaloa cartel which has these groups called Los Mexicles and the, the artist assassins in our part. And they have this weird evangelical Christian part. Hmm. And I was in there, spent, and, I, and I, the, 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 the time that the prison director, and it was, it was open and he let me keep on going back and forth in there, spend time in, spend days in this, in this prison. And they have these like weird evangelical ceremonies in the prison. They were like dancing, getting rid of their demons and stuff. It was kind of crazy scenes. And I talked to one guy who was quite a heavy cartel guy um, who'd been a head of assassins and, 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 and pretty brutal stuff. And I was there, it was me and a cameraman, we were there in the cell and we started talking to him. And he started kind of going on this full on, you know, confession, how he decapitated people while they're still alive and stuff and all this kind of stuff. And uh, we were there and, and the prison guy was there and he said to the guy, you know, you're saying this on camera. You know, what are the implications? They can see your face here. And he's like, oh no, you can't show my face. Oh, okay, we'll, we'll black out. And he goes, oh, and my voice is also, like people will know my voice because I've done a lot of phone phone calls and people can hear my voice and stuff, phone calls, threatening people and stuff. And then we said, like, we're, you know, we're not going to show the video by using material, the written material of what he said. But it's it's not, you know, a nice story. These guys, not, a lot of them don't have nice, like, it's not like a nice and a happy ending. This guy's got like, I, I, I hacked all these people up. I got all this. It's not, you know, not necessarily ending ending nice for these guys. So there is ways to reach them. So I think that's that's one thing is like, how do you, you try and approach this? But the third thing is like the drug profits. Now, it's the economic motive is driving this. Mm -hmm. So we got this multi-billion dollar industry. The United Nations a few years ago used to say it was worth $300 billion globally, drug trade. There's a, a, the RAND as a study there, they estimate the US illegal drug market is $150 billion. $150 billion. Per year. Wow. Okay, you see these, you talk to drug traffickers. You know, like they buy, okay, where, where do you go to cocaine? Look at cocaine. $2,000 a kilo in Colombia. Uh, what, $12,000 in Mexico, um, $20,000 at the border, $30,000, $40,000 in New York, $100,000, break it up, you know, you can suddenly make it worth $200,000, $300,000. These profits going so fast. So this is what drug traffickers are doing. You put money in, you're taking money out. You're making huge, huge returns on your investments. So that's why, like, I mean, no, you see anybody, you know, people want to be, we want, we're in a capitalist world, People want to make money. You know what, you know, the kind of business we're in, media. Yeah. <laughs> not, a lot, not a lot of bucks in this, you know, we struggle to make a buck out of this. Imagine that, you can, you know, I'm going to put in, I'm going to put in $100,000 to this and I'm going to turn, you know, take away half a million in a couple of months or more. So this is like, why? Like, this is so much money with this and, you know, anyone can do it. So like, then people fight and the most violent people take over. Now, at the same time, it's still not an easy solution. You say, like, you know, I, I, um, I do believe that, you know, legalized marijuana, um, might as well legalize marijuana, I think, at this point. But now we've got fentanyl. Now, yeah. fentanyl is, the profits are even bigger than cocaine because fentanyl, you're, you know, you've got these tiny little chemical, you know, chemical stuff. It's extremely potent, less bulk. You don't have to worry about the whole harvesting process of like growing coca leaves and crop spraying. Labs in China. The Mexican cartels want to even create their own precursors. So maybe even some point China could be outside the equation, but right now China's part of this. And you've got Americans dying now. I mean, this is horrific numbers. 107,000 overdose deaths in 2021 in the United States. About 70,000 involved fentanyl. Not 30,000 involved crystal meth. It, I mean, they're using it as weapons now, too. I'm seeing over and over again. It's becoming more and more common. You know, we're seeing police officers go down from fentanyl exposure. Mm. Before we get into the fentanyl yeah. 
crisis, I want to rewind, and I, I do want to say I, th I think that the educational program that you're speaking of it, is that is that is that just your idea, or is somebody no, no, looking they, at maybe implementing that because yeah, that could really work. You know, in in my initial thought was there's no way that's going to work because there's going to be multi generational cartel members. But then when you talk about how their life is, one of the questions I ask a lot of the special operations guys, you know, that I interview on here is, would you want your kid to have the life that you had knowing what you know now? And I don't know the exact number, but it's got to be 90% wow. say, no, I don't uh, want my kid to have to live through that. Well, that, 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 that's like, you know, working on special operations with a, with a government salary and, you, and people consider you a hero, let alone being, you know, a cartel figure. I mean, like I said, there's different people, and some of them are unrepentant. Mm -hmm. Some of them have made it work for them. There's traffickers who've made this stuff work for them, have ended up stashing their assets and making deals with the government, and, and, and they end up being kind of clean with it. But a lot of people, they, 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 they don't want their kids. Um, and and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's bizarre. Like, I, I've been with gang members, cartel members, and they're like... On one side, they, you know, they kill 27 people. On the other side, they're talking about they go to their the parents' evening at their, at their kids' school. And they're like, they're, they're kind of, some of these people, it's a, it's a weird, bizarre world. And you get into them, like a lot of them, um, they, they kind of struggle and, and want to you know, get a normal life out of this and stuff. Um, they kind of live through this, this, this area of brutal violence. I think, you know, yeah, a lot of, a very good point. I think a lot of the kind of special forces, military people, you can, you can sit down and probably sit in a room with these guys and kind of understand mm -hmm. and share a beer or have a cup of coffee because you both had, you know, you've seen extreme violence. You know what it's like. You've seen bed, dead bodies. You know what it's like, okay, to, how, how do I process killing this guy? Um, how do I deal with that? Now, um, some of these, these sicarios, I think they simply say, well, I'm taking orders. And they are. It's killing machines. You're recruited in. It's just like, well, I've got orders to go and kill these guys. So I'm doing but if you look at like why does the real severe violence come about? Like why you know you know and ask this question: what, why why do they leave? Um, the, the worst atrocity, or one of the worst atrocities in Mexico, which I've covered, was forty nine bodies dumped on a road, all decapitated, all with their hands cut off, and their feet cut off, dumped on a road. I got a call, and it was Sunday morning. It's 2012, I've got a call. Oh, something's happening up in Monterrey. Oh, I jumped, jumped on a plane, flew up there. When I got up there, they'd taken the bodies and put them in the morgue. So I went in the morgue and the smell of 49 bodies that they couldn't identify because they had no heads, no hands and no feet. Just 49 lumps of meat. And it's like, why, why do they do that? What are they doing stuff? I actually recently got a, met one of the guys in the cartel in prison in the United States who was involved in, in, in that cartel and gave me a bit of an explanation for, for, for what they were doing with that there. But one of the things you see is you have combatants, people with, you know, with, with structures, irregular arm, armed organizations, and they're, control, they're told to control territory. Top of their boss, you've got to control territory. So how do we control territory? We use terror. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, they are using terror or terrorists, but the same way that the military groups have, have done this for forever. How do we control this territory? We've got many people scared of us. I mean, it makes sense. You know, yeah. As brutal as it is, it does make a hell of a lot of sense. And when you're recruiting you know, kids that are 12, 13 years old, I mean, by the time, I mean, they have to be desensitized like that. Yeah, so you know. so, so, you, so you're they're training up these kids. Now I tell you a horror story of what of of, of of that on that same uh, investigation, same time I went up there. So I was in the morgue, forty nine bodies, and making sense of this. And I came out of the morgue, and there was a bunch of of like family members looking, and like I was like, you know, what's going on? They talked to to one woman. He said, like, "Oh, you know, we're trying to find if our loved ones who have disappeared." are among these victims. So we want to do DNA tests. And this one woman I talked to was a school teacher. 
and she described how her son was dragged out of their home on one evening, 18-year-old son, philosophy student. What happened was they were sit- she was sitting there, she had her two sons there, one 18-year-old, one 15-year-old. And suddenly the door, bang, 15 guys come in with guns. Start Because once you get these armed groups, they can start you know, ravaging, attacking the local population. Storm in the house, start grabbing stuff. And then they say to her, which of your sons is the oldest? And she's like, can't even answer, can't even speak. Like, how to answer that? And the elder son raised his hand and said, I'm the eldest. You know, you're not gonna take my little brother. And they took him. She got a phone call the next day. Okay, give us this amount of money, we'll give you a son back. She got the money, you know, what, what can you, what you do as a parent at that moment? Got the money, wherever she could, relatives went up, handed it in, phoned up, no response. That was it, her son was gone. She was wandering around these events, these morgues, trying to find him. Other mothers I've talked to, same, very similar stories, who eventually found and identified the bodies of their kids after like three years. One of them in Veracruz, and I talked to her when she was looking for her kid who was taken away by our men, whose guy worked at customs, 24 years old. And eventually she identified his body. They, she was, and she, she become with a group of mothers searching for, you know, you've just got thousands of disappearances that have come out of this conflict. So she was searching uh, for his, you know, for him with these, with these various mothers, they were like marching. And a guy pulled up in a car and said, um, check out this place. And he had like a, a hand-drawn map. You might find some bodies here. So they went there. to do, First they said to the government, oh, we got this information of a government, like, hey, whatever. So they went there themselves and started digging up in this field and started finding bones, skulls, bodies. Turned out to be the big, biggest mass grave in Mexico. In, in the modern time, 297. 297 remains. I mean, and this is like, but I mean, 297 skulls. I mean, and this is a mess, because like, it seemed hard, these like bones, five years old, eight years old, one year old, two year old remains. They started pulling them out. Eventually, after several years, her son was identified in this mass grave. While they were pulling them out, so you start getting that smell again, that smell of, of kind of, you know, bodies being pulled out. Right in front of it was a housing area. Attempts at middle class homes, the kind of, you know, the, uh, kiddies, bikes, basketball hoops, and the, and the families that write things saying, well, you know, we're getting this stink of this coming in, into our housing. And that's, that's how, how, like, bizarre messed up this conflict is. You know, that, that makes me just rethink the, what is the, what are they trying to achieve by storming people's houses and just pulling their kids out? And killing, telling them that they're going to take a ransom for yeah, it, and yeah. then killing them. Uh, so I think what happens a lot. I mean, and there's the, in a, every every case has got different stories, but in that case, what you can happen. I mean, like you've got the, the you know brutal soldiers. You know, and you you can relate to this. Um, you know, being a soldier, imagine the most kind of brutal soldiers, but so you haven't gone through like good recruitment. They've kind of rec- recruited the kind of meanest. Um, hateful people they can find mm-hmm. from the streets, but in a sense they're, they're you know you know victims and victimizers to an extent. But yeah, still you know hateful brutal people train them up, make them bloody, and tell you, you guys have got to control these territories, give them guns, make them commit terror. Then once you've got an armed group out there committing terror, okay, uh, we want some money. It's just going to raid a house. It's going to raid a store. It's going to steal a car. Do what you like. Raid someone's house, steal some stuff. Okay, we'll take this son. Let's get some, get him to pay a ransom. Kill him anyway. 
Mud Water is a coffee alternative with four adaptogenic mushrooms and ativeric herbs. With only a fraction of caffeine as a cup of coffee, Mud Water can help you get energy without jitters or the crash of coffee. Each ingredient was added for a purpose. Cacao and chai for mood and a microdose of caffeine. Lion's Mane to help with alertness. Cordyceps to help support physical performance. Chaga and Rishi to help support your immune system. Turmeric for minor occasional soreness and cinnamon for antioxidants. I think it tastes great. My favorite ingredient is the lion's mane because I like to help my alertness. How do I drink it? I just put it in a cup, stir it up, and slam it down. Mud Water's Whole30 approved, 100% USDA organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and it's kosher certified. Mudwater donates monthly to a public education center for psychedelic research as Mudwater believes this country is in a mental health epidemic and sees psychedelics as useful tools to aid individuals with depression, PTSD, anxiety, and other mental health problems. Go to mudwater.com slash Sean to support the show and use code Sean Mud for 15% off. These statements and products have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or condition. Maybe we cured him already. Maybe we beat the crap out of this kid and killed him already. Or maybe we recruit these people and you, you get you know people who are recruited and forced to do stuff. You know, recruit and force them, put themselves, give the, you know, give these people we recruit, give them a gun and tell them to do some stuff. Yeah. Or, or, or hack up bodies or do this or do that. Um, it's, it's, it's brutal. It, it's, it's kind of, one of, the, one of the crazy things about this um, is this, I mean, that kind of level of almost like medieval kind of warfare, kind of medieval mor- you know, morality in this stuff. Um, and, and in some ways you can look at medieval stuff, the way these cartels operate. It's like fealty. You know, you've got like one powerful drug boss and then a guy below who's like swearing fealty to him and a guy below swearing fealty to him. But that's happening. At the same time, you've got like, say, a trillion dollar economy. You've got, um, you can go to Mexico City and you can sit in a Starbucks and, you know, sit there on your laptop and you can go to a trendy bar. Um, you can go to Cancun and go to some, you know, beautiful beaches. And that's happening as well at the same time. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of weird how this kind of normality is around this like very harsh conflict. You know, back to the back to the education program that you had. Is how many of these kids even have a choice? I mean, if they're going into mm-hmm. residents, yanking them out, and forcing them to go yeah. pack bodies up, or or become a Sicario hitman, or, or whatever. Even if it's just a lookout, what is there even an option to say no? Yeah. So, so that's that's the thing. So so like yeah, so what you asked before about like is this my idea? Like I've interviewed. And we have met plenty of social workers out there in Mexico and other places, in Jamaica, in El Salvador, and, you know, different places around the place. In, in Juarez, uh, there was a, a woman I interviewed a bunch of times, you know, I, knew her, I still phone her up for a very, very real smart woman. She used to work in a factory herself in the city, and she was doing social work, stuff like this. And she was, you know, she was, she taught me a lot of this stuff. Um, this is what's happening here. Um for a time, they were getting money. For a time when Juarez, uh, be- Juarez became the most murderous city in the world around 2010, 11. And then, you know, you would get some of the U.S. money going to these programs. USAID would start going to some of these social work programs and stuff. And it helped, did help get the violence down for a while. But it kind of peters out, this stuff. Um, and, and the Mexican government, you know, they have, you know, the problem is, you know, it's, it's corruption. You get the Mexican government, you know, some top level, I oh, will give out money for crime prevention. Then you get like middle men who are not really good players, mm-hmm. just stealing money. And then you get people like distracted and, and, and doing stuff like these really bad prevention programs rather than getting to the really good people who are, and there are good people there who are on the ground, who know. And like I say, it's kind of, you've got to reach these kids young. A di- more difficult question. I mean, you know, I think we can, all of us can, can probably agree that trying to steer 12 year old kids away from this lifestyle is a good thing. More difficult is what you do with the kids who are 18 who have committed multiple murders already. I mean, you know, there's not much help. I mean, you know, can you create, you know, but how can you find any way, any way of them out of these cartels? Is it only prison or death for these guys? Mm-hmm. 
and they're committing a bunch of you know horrible crimes. So is, you know, can you have kind of any armistice, any kind of peace deal? Um, dis, you know, like uh, you know, you know, disarmament, disbanding these forces. You know, maybe you can't. They kind of tried a bit in some places and they haven't, they haven't really worked. In Colombia, they've kind of done that a bit more. It's like with the guerrilla group in Colombia. They're like, okay, we can try and disarm them and try, create a program to try and demobilize these people. You know, I just <clears throat> I uh, reached out to somebody I'm trying to get on the show, actually. His name's Rick Doblin. He's, uh, he runs MAPS, hmm. which is a psychedelic uh, nonprofit out of Canada. They do a ton of research. And he said he's actually in Iceland right now doing a uh, some type of a of some type of a convention, big meeting with um, police officers and and actually the person I'm going to butcher this, but he's in charge of the prison system in Iceland, and they're thinking about implementing some type of a psychedelic program. It sounds like may possibly with MDMA. Um, in, in doing this therapy for people coming out of the prison systems, hoping that it's going to help um, help them transition back into you know a normal life and 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 increase the probability that they will not you know commit the same type of crime again. Do you think do you think there's any possibility of that happening down there? Well, see, one of the problems there is like you know you, you know, if, if it's your family who who had who had a kid you know butchered. You know, you don't want no forgiveness for these people. That's true. Um, I mean, some of the, there was a case of, I mean, some, some of the, they actually use, one of those they use young kids as well to commit murders because young kids, in the Mexican justice system, in some states they can only get five years in prison. Okay. Um, so there's kids who commit, I mean, there was a, there was a, there was a case of a kid, you know, it was Al Ponchis a few years ago. He was actually a U.S. citizen. Really? So he might be back here in the United States. But he was, uh, this was going back a few, uh, a few years, and he was, there was videos of him where they had guys hanging up and he was part of the crew, and he was like a little mascot with the crew, like beating and torturing these guys. And then when the military caught him, and there was journalists around there, when the military caught him, and I know one of the guys who was there, and he asked him this, that they put the cameras up. And this guy's got three sons and was kind of knew how to talk to him. And was like kind of stern, you know, what have you done? I'd like decapitate four people. It's like fourteen year old kid said that. I had it on camera. It was on, it was on TV. So it became a kind of big scandal. And the guy did five years or so. He's out, released, probably up here in the United States now. Um, you know, other cases where people are older and they can give them give them longer sentences. But it's like how much you know, you know, you know if, if you're the mother whose son was dragged away and murdered. You know, you're, you're, want, you're going to want him in prison as you can. There's no death penalty in Mexico. Even even a country where you have you know you can have thirty five thousand murders in a year and no death that's, penalty. That's ironic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and and another thing is that they call a lot of the time they call the hits executions. Really? So they call them in Spanish. They're like executions. They used to use the word like ejecutados, executed. So it's there, like, you know, from them, it's like, well, from the cartel point of view, we have a kind of process here. We, we you know, we, we made a judgment. The guy's got to go. We're going to execute him. So, ex- you know, you have all these they executions. They set the rules. Yeah, yeah. They set the rules. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, on, on the flip side, so, I mean, you know, on the one side, you've got, you know, I, I really do believe in, 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 in the social programs, particularly, say, for the... The younger kids, I mean, you know, 12 years old below, before they've been recruited. But, you know, you've got to have uh, crate law enforcement. You've got to, you can't have impunity. You can't have, now in, in Mexico overall, um, about 90% of murders go unpunished. Now it's really a bit more than that. The, that figure is like based on saying for every 100 murders, in ten, in ten of those cases, somebody has been sent to prison or given, you know, sentence for those murders. The other ninety, nobody has. Sometimes, really though, they only caught one person, but there's several people involved. Sometimes they caught the wrong person. In some states, it's like ninety-eight percent impunity. So for every fifty murders, only one of those cases has somebody been sentenced to it. Imagine if you're 
you know, you could be a hitman, but also just a regular guy. You want to kill somebody, you think, well, <laughs> I've got one in 50 chance of being caught. I'm not exactly a deterrent. So it's like you've got to have, you've got to fight impunity. But to do that when the situation is so bad, right, like right now, you've got to have pretty hard enforcement and to try and bring things down, kind of set some rules and kind of like, you know, push this down from where it's at right now, which is like, on, you, know, on, you know, on the edge, on the, you know, on, the, on the cliff, the cliff of the abyss. Interesting. <sighs> Rewinding real quick all the way back uh, to what it, we talked about declaring them a terrorist organization hmm. or some type of insurgency. What would the what would the downfall be? The downside be of, of yeah. that. I mean, so we're talking about from the U.S. policy point of view, yeah? We can talk about it from any. Or from the, Mex- from the Mexican. I mean, because yeah. the Mexican, they, they do use sometimes terrorist charges against them. I'm, I'm asking because I, f- I feel like the minute that that happens, that they get declared a terrorist organization or an insurgency, funding is going to come extremely fast and there's going to be a ton of it. Hmm. So... That's that's why I don't understand why they don't just okay. So 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 like say say we look at, uh, we look at this like U.S. says let's look at the Sinaloa cartel or the Jalisco New Generation cartel, particularly been mentioned. But look look, look at the Sinaloa cartel. So say if you declare okay, the Sinaloa cartel is a terrorist organization, then it's not like. So with Al Qaeda, you know, you have these kind of certain targeted members you're going to target, you're going to find out these networks mm-hmm. um, and go around and get them. We're talking about in Sinaloa. This is an organization or it's a network really more than an organization with hundreds of thousands of people only involved in this. I mean, this is like... you. You go to these villages, you go to the town, go to the city. This is just a huge, huge thing. So you get drawn into so saying, so saying, okay, we can just target anybody who's involved. And a lot of people, it's like a lot of the time, it's it's a it's a, it's a loose network in these places. Or you know, you've got like a it's kind of medieval in some ways. You have powerful people and people who swear loyalty to them in these areas. Um, you're gonna go in, you know, we're gonna, gonna go in Mexico with with U.S. drones. Like even if you take out. 50 of these guys, 100 of these guys, it's going to keep on coming back. You're kind of drawn into a real swamp there. Um, you know, and, you know, you start flying those kind of missions into Mexico, you know, is that going to, you know, it's not, it's not like there's a, a, a quick go in there and take it. It's not like there's like a thousand guys you can take out. Mm-hmm. The problem's over. In the country of Mexico, we're talking about millions of people. It's more like, I mean, because these are say sprawling organizations, and and you know you say they're involved in a bunch of stuff. It's not only drugs anymore. Dr- drugs are huge, and drugs finance them and make them so powerful. Because when you make billions and billions from drugs, you buy so many guns, you train so many sicarios, you buy so much corruption protection, you become a very very powerful group, which then allows you to do a bunch of other stuff. So then, okay, human smuggling into the United States. Uh, I was down in, in Tijuana um, and I, I found a human smuggler there. You know, initially he was like, I went, I went there. And I asked around, who, who's this? And then said, oh, there's this guy here. He, he, he's, you know, there's been these, they call them polleros, who are like chicken herders. And at first it was like, you know, you, you could be anything. You know, you're a white guy. There's, there's Ukrainians, you know, Russians. There's, there's anybody all around the world. They're looking for money all the time. I went there and I very quickly said I was a journalist because I didn't want to like string him along too much because right as soon as that he's like changed. But like he confirmed numbers with me and I confirmed them with a guy who ran an American uh, ICE agent who who ran uh, and a kind of task force looking at these uh, immigrant smuggling groups and he he had a lot of sources inside as well. The numbers are pretty much there. Like they're now the numbers have shot right up, so it's like twelve to fifteen thousand dollars head now going in more like they, they would take them on boats around the coast like eighteen thousand dollars um they got like 
some other stuff that through worse deserts it's a bit cheaper and there's thing now of, of asylum claim where they just flip them over the wall to hand themselves in like for five hundred dollars just like just jump you over the wall and you hand yourself into into the border patrol and and try and claim asylum but anyway people actually smuggling sneaking into the united states you've got millions of people paying for this services so to do the maths i mean the, the mexican foreign secretary said they reckon like over 10 billion a year on human smuggling. Where, where, where are they getting this money? The smugglers, the, the, the migrants paying. Mm -hmm. Well, you think about that. Um, I mean, you, you just said twelve to fifteen thousand yeah, yeah. dollars a head. Yeah, yeah. And these people are coming from nothing. Yeah, yeah. Making, you know, I, th I think you threw the number out three hundred bucks a month. You know, to, yeah, yeah. to 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 be a lookout for a cartel. Where do they come up with twelve, fifteen thousand dollars? Yeah, yeah. So say if you got, fa I mean, you might have family members in the United States already. Um, think about the investment. I mean, you know, you might, you know, even if you're paying, even if you pay fifteen thousand dollars to get to the United States, how much could you work make here over ten years? No, I, t I completely understand. Yeah, so I'm saying, where do they get the yeah, money? Physically get the money. To I would say mm. over fifty percent of the population in the U.S. probably doesn't have fifteen thousand dollars in their bank account. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you got you know family networks. Um, you know, a lot of the time. Families, you might have a family who's, you know, in El Salvador, they're, li they're, they're a lot more living through remittances in, in lot part villages in Mexico. You go to these villages and like everything's built through money sent back from the United States. And so you, you're building up a family network and you're saving up money and putting, then like, okay, another thing that happens, you say, okay, I haven't got $15,000. I can come up with five. Okay. You pay me off. Then I've got something over you. Then I can hold one of these guys prisoner until you pay the money back and, and so forth. So then you get like these things where you get like uh, stashes of, you know, in, in, in had a bunch of these in Phoenix for a while, these big, you know, people held up and it was like, it's because people were like, they had, didn't have the money, or they pay half up front and half when they were delivered and they, were, they couldn't get the family members to pay them. So they end up kind of kidnapping these people in the United States for that kind of money. But I was just saying, so like you've got human smuggling, huge business. Um, mining. Now, mining, a lot of gold being mined in Mexico. A lot of foreign companies, particularly Canadian, going in there for the mining. Cartels control the areas. Cartels have now realized there's a big amount of cash in mine, gold mining and they want a piece of that. There's also a lot of lithium mining going on in Mexico, correct? There's lithium. It's not really happening yet money-wise. Okay. Um, there was a massive lithium deposit found in Sonora. Uh, the, you know, they initially said, oh, this is the biggest in the world. It's a bit more complicated. I talked to some somebody involved in the mine. It's a bit more complicated. It's like lithium everywhere. It's like verified. They were investing a bunch of money before they'd got a real return. Then the Mexican government said, oh, we want that. And they, they said, we'll nationalize lithium like oil. And then the, then the companies were like, oh, we can't make any money out of this then. So it's not really happening yet, but there's a lot of lithium in Mexico, a lot of potential there. But gold, silver, there's a lot of lot of money being made out of that right now. And a lot of the companies, I mean, at the end of the day, we'll, we'll settle for, you know, we've got to pay a certain percentage of, of what we make here to the community, the local community, mm -hmm. who's running and controlling the local community. Um, so that's another industry. And then you've got oil theft, which is, you know, drilling into pipelines and taking out oil. And that's worth billions a year. I, mean, that's I had no idea that was happening. Yeah, yeah, huge. They call it, in, in Spanish, they call it huachicoleros. Huachicol is stolen oil. It's uh, been a big deal for, for a lot of years. So you've got, you know, Mexico's a huge oil producer. And these these groups who are now taking over by cartels or working with cartels, but there's a tradition of these oil thieves. They often drill two holes. They drill in one hole to take out oil and drill in another hole to put in uh, another liquid to try and equalize the pressure. There was one incident that was like a really bad drill. It just the oil was spurting out and a bunch of people from the, the local town came and started filling up all their gas cans and then it exploded and it killed like over 100 people. It's like brutal. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, huge. Uh, I mean, an, an incredible loss for, for government. And, and this president's tried to crack down on oil theft, but it still goes on. I've been to a place in Sinaloa where they're selling stolen gasoline. And, 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 and you drive in there, and it's not even that, I mean, you know, it's too cheap, but it's like, say, 35, 40% cheaper than it is at the pumps. So it's cheaper, but it's not like, you know, dirt cheap considering it's stolen gasoline. And I went in there with a guy I work with in Sinaloa. And we went in there, went in there, we drove in there, and they had a bunch of these just just big old uh, like plastic cans of of or plastic containers of, of gasoline. And they were doing this spraying this, this stuff all the time because of the smell, I think. And they went in there and he filled up his car and there's other cars there, nice cars, different stuff that go in there, paying cash, buy stolen gasoline. <laughs> that's that's refined gasoline. So you've got that business as well. Um, you know, you've got uh, product piracy, um, you know, pirated goods, truck theft. I mean, there's a huge amount of cargo theft in Mexico. And then markets which sell stolen goods. And, um, yeah, so you've got, you know, enormous... So they have a lot of verticals. Yeah, yeah. You've got their, their diversified uh, organized crime networks is really what they are now. But drugs are still huge and selling drugs locally and trafficking drugs. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's got to be something done about this. Um, you know, societies shouldn't live with this. Uh, and you're seeing, I think, for the last couple of years, more of a lean towards harder approaches. Would you like to see them be labeled a terrorist organization personally? Uh, I it doesn't. It would like. It doesn't upset me a lot. What they do is, is, is terrorism. I just don't think it's a silver bullet. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I can see. You know. You know. The, the, I could. You know. Can hear arguments about this uh, from. I can see from certain American law enforcement perspective. You can just say go after these guys. And you don't have to go through like, like the DEA. When they go after these guys, they, they, they do a lot of paperwork. They build up files on these guys. And it takes them like two years sometimes to like they build up and they got to all this. They have to have these informants and these wiretaps and all this stuff, and they're building up this paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. Go before a grand jury and get these indictments, get them out, and then get the extra. You know, they're like years bogged down in this stuff. And then by that time, you know, that, <laughs> the guy's already being killed, and someone else is like running stuff. So you can see like it's an argument, you know, that, that you know has somebody make it's like we've got to you know just change the game now. This is different game now. They're terrorists right away. And anybody we can kind of prove any kind of link to this, we can just take them out. Uh, but still, it's like you know, they're you know, so the, 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 there's so many of these people. It's like, well, you, you know, you're not going to go in there and take out, you know, like uh, you're going to go in there and start shooting up villages like in Afghanistan, or, or, or like you know, doing drone strikes like in Afghanistan or whatever. And um, you know, what reaction would that create from 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 the Mexican population? And are people not, not even involved? So, so I don't see it as a silver bullet, um, but you know, I'm not, I'm not, and I don't think it's it's outrageous. Yeah. Well, let's take a quick break. Yeah. We we'll come back. We'll uh, we'll we'll get into the fentanyl. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. out every day, you get in a gunfight outside of your fob, then you come home, and then you got to deal with the base getting hit. How many engagements would you say you were a part of in that eight months? Do you have any idea? I lost count, it was that many. Just to put that in perspective for you, because most guys don't think about this, that's 180 fucking engagements. Our very first op, the Hilo crashed. Oh shit. Killed everybody. One guy survived. I want to take a call. 
I have your dad on the line, Jim. Hey, Jim, how's it going? This is Sean Ryan. I was just always curious how he really felt when you actually landed in Afghanistan with the team for that first appointment. I kind of just in the back of my mind hoped that you understood or at least somewhat understood what I was actually going to do. Yeah, that was definitely an emotional day for me. I didn't like, I still remember that call clearly. I, I didn't want to run on to him how, how emotional it was. Fucking every night, right when sundown, these dudes would just smash us with small arms and they would, it would be effective. A lot of times when you lose guys in a combat zone and you know them, it'll create a type of ritual did I do anything? I'm gonna take another call. We got a mutual friend on the line who was there that whole second deployment with you, Jeff Reed. Dude, I am doing great. How are you doing? And there's a picture of you and Jeff and another guy's face that's blurred out. Do you ever shoot the goose nuts off on that mount up at the mountain? Hell yeah, I do. All right, we're back from the break. That was a fantastic lunch, by the way. Um, so since we're kind of on the subject of structure of the cartels, how they recruit, I've never really gotten into how how prevalent are the cartels outside of Mexico's borders? Are they setting up shop here in the U.S.? Are they setting up shop in places like Honduras, El Salvador, Colombia, Peru, Venezuela, you know, Guatemala? Panama, or, or are they staying in Mexico? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, they, they're huge in the United States. I mean, they're massive. Uh, they operate in the United States very differently than Mexico. So it's like kind of attack and defense, that kind of difference. Okay. But they're all over. I mean, they're pretty much in every, I would say they're probably in every state in the United States, uh, in some way operating, connecting. So, so what does that mean? Like whereas in Mexico, uh, you know, you have, you know, Sinaloa, Culiacan, you know, you have hundreds of gunmen on standby all the time, ready to jump on stuff, policing things, policing labs, in a bunch of businesses, um, ready to kidnap people, shake people down, kill people at will. Here they're very different. Or traditionally they have been. So there's been a few times, if you look over the years, when they started dropping bodies in the United States. One was over in Texas, when the Setas started killing a bunch of people in South Texas in the 2000s. One was over in California, around the San Diego area, when a break off from the Ariana Felix cartel started killing a bunch of people, a group called Los Palillos. Both times, law enforcement hit them very hard. So they kind of learned this lesson, okay, in the United States, we can make billions of dollars. But there's certain things we don't want to do. We don't want to kill too many people. Sometimes even they're better off kidnapping somebody in the United States. It might be a, it might be a Mexican national anyway, or it could be somebody from here. Driving them into Mexico and committing the murder over there. Really? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Particularly on the El Paso Juarez border. You've got this group called the Barrio Azteca, who are a cross-border organization working with the Juarez cartel began as a prison gang in Texas and grew and basically became a paramilitary organization. But they're also very active in Texas. And they kidnap people, drive into Mexico and kill them in Mexico, drop a, you know, another body in, in Juarez. Because, you know, look think about the investigation. In, in Juarez in 2010, there was 3,000 murders. In El Paso, there was like 12. Wow. So like, you're gonna dump it in Juarez and it becomes one of 3,000 you know, murders not investigated or have it in El Paso where it can be like investigated. So they, they learned a lesson over the years of, okay, we don't kill people in the same, you know, we don't, we're not gonna do all these crazy kind of beheadings, but they're all here. And unless they're gonna be killing police officers like they do in Mexico every day, in Mexico they can kill police officers if they're not on their payroll. Here in the United States, it's more difficult. Now, I'll give a butt to that. Historically, that's been the case. With the way law enforcement in the United States is right now, demoralized, losing uh, officers, is that always gonna be the case? Yeah, I see where you're, you're talking about the defund the police movement, how well, that's shaped out. Yeah, what's happening in the United States? I mean, I talk to officers here in the United States, talk to agencies in the United States, they're pretty much demoralized. Not only the police departments, 
an anti-narcotics officer pretty demor- demoralized in many cases. Also, a lot of the federal agencies, a lot of these, these DEA agents, are like this. there's just a general malaise. A lot of people are fed up with their organizations mm-hmm. in many cases. Now, will they have the same way of hitting these cartels very hard? Will they always last? I don't know. I would say cartels are only getting stronger here over the years. Now, what does it really mean how they're operating here? So if you look at, um, um, you, they, they drive drugs in from Mexico into the United States and have hubs, hub cities. Los Angeles, Phoenix, Houston, up in Chicago, these can be hubs. They drive a bunch of drugs up there, then they move them around and they go down the chain to smaller towns. What's happened over the years, you see the change, like first you had the Colombians, trafficking a lot of drugs into the United States, cocaine. Then the Colombians were paying Mexicans to traffic the drugs themselves. Like, say, the the Colombians were bringing the cocaine in back in the 1980s, flying it right into Florida. Then that was shut down with the uh, Miami Task Force, um, Florida Task, you know, anti-drug task force, Navy ships, all that kind of stuff. They kind of made it more difficult to bring drugs, fly them right over the Caribbean from Colombia into Florida. So the Colombians turned to Mexico and the Mexican cartels who were already moving weed and heroin. And they said, okay, we're going to pay you to traffic cocaine for us. We give it to you in Colombia or we give it to you in Panama or somewhere in Central America and you move that up and deliver it to us in the United States and we, we sell it. And the Colombians a lot of the time were wholesalers. They wholesaled, United States, uh, wholesaled cocaine in the United States then it goes down and like, all different you know, different people get involved. Then they start paying the Mexicans and then the Mexicans say, well, we want a piece of this. So for a while it was like, we own this cocaine between us 50-50. Then the Mexicans in the end just started buying the cocaine from the Colombians, just buy off you in Colombia for a couple of thousand bucks a key and we can move it ourselves and make the profits ourselves. So you had the Mexicans becoming the, the, the cartels that would move the cocaine and be the wholesalers. But then you see another change you start seeing, and you saw this first with a group called La Familia Michoacana, and then the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, you saw a whole other groups of immigrant communities in the 2000s. Michoacana and Jalisco, particularly large numbers of immigrants across the whole United States. So whereas before the you know, Mexicans would bring it into Los Angeles, you know, bunch of cocaine, bunch of drugs, sell it to people, it would get to these small towns gradually. They started creating networks in these small towns. So suddenly all these places, you know, you know, it's, it's sad to say because the, the vast majority of Mexicans are very hardworking migrants in these places, but within and kind of piggybacking off these migrant communities, you've got dealers setting up shops in these, shops in these places. Uh, so suddenly you've got a spread of networks all over the place, all over the country. And then, you know, you have dealers in you know the Midwest, in in, in in small towns in the Midwest, with direct lines to the Jalisco cartel. Okay. Now still they're like okay they're they're, they're moving drugs so they're the main activities, moving drugs around the country, distributing them. Still off, often they'll go right down to kind of kilo level and then like the street dealers can be can be a mix of people. Moving the money and collecting the money, laundering the money, or moving the money back to Mexico and acquiring firearms and taking them to Mexico as well. Some of the key operations are what the cartels are doing here. Now they're not, they're not like in Mexico involved in, you know, like, uh, you know, our and, and, and the human smuggling and bringing people to the United States and the networks as well, because they're not only bringing them into the, crossing the border of the United States, when you pay that money, that'll allow you to go to any, you know, any city you want. You could be going to your family in Atlanta to work and you're paying your ticket there. So they've got very significant operations. Now, you know, what does that mean in the future? I'd be concerned. Mm -hmm. Um, Seeing Mexico, seeing how how these organized crime in Mexico, you know, really tears it apart, I'd be concerned about what this means in the future. I mean, to me, I think the biggest concern would be them intermingling in our our politics Hmm. and infiltrating the police departments, mm. the military, the border patrol, DEA, FBI, all of them, you know? Do you think, because I have heard that they are 
specifically sending guys into the military to get trained, then come back, come out, and then train the cartels, the U.S. military tactics. I don't see why that wouldn't be true. Yeah, so so first in terms of infiltrating stuff, you've, you've already got, we've already got a track record of certain police officers, certain uh, officials working with the cartels. Uh, and it, it, I mean, it can be different things. I've got, got one interview I did with a guy who was working for the cartel, an American guy here working for the cartel, who was uh, working for actually a cable company lay, laying cable, but he had a government ID. And he had a government ID to go back and forth over the border. Now, he was shifted guns for them, shifted firearms from the United States to Texas, to, from the United States to Mexico, using a government ID. And also, he then got involved in it. He was like driving around laying cables. He had scanners. And he was following the border patrol and giving all this information to the cartel. And he was... He said, I mean, he was doing it for the money, but also he was kind of doing it for a thrill as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was like surprised how clumsy the border patrol was. He was, he was said, it was like a clumsy, they're kind of giving away a lot of stuff. It's very easy for me to locate all this stuff. And I'm giving that to the cartel so the cartel knows and, and, and operates this stuff. Now, you've also got cases of cops um, in some of the border towns in the US side and some border patrol agents who have been, have been caught working with the, with the cartels. And there, there, there's cases um, out there. Uh, I think it's obviously a, a far smaller level than Mexico, but it's, it's still out there and it's something to be concerned about. In terms of getting military instruction for the cartels, you've seen um, US vets recruited by the cartels. Uh, How are they recruiting them? Like how how are they are they getting to them? How are they mm-hmm. finding them for recruitment? Um, some some of them some of the cases that I've seen of solid cases have been Mexican Mexican Americans who have been in some cases even deported for any other reasons. Even though they've been in the military, they've messed up or something. Took papers, committed some crime afterwards and end up being deported, so they're back in those kind of networks in Mexico, and they're, and they're like, you know, obviously got very sellable skills. But there have been, there's also some cases of kind of US, you know, American military guys. I'm not sure exactly how, how what the outreach would be, like exactly who the connections are. I mean, um, A lot, you know, it may be in some of the kind of mercenary security circles. Uh, there's, there's there's definitely like a lot of cartels are hungry for ex-military people from whatever. So you know, it used to, a few years ago, they would actually advertise and they had like, like um, actually they'd hang up blankets writing like, you know, are you military or ex-military you know, oh, man. we'll hire you in Mexico. We'll hire you. You know, don't ride to the bus. You know, don't ride. You know, ride bus the bus to the work. Um, you know, we'll hire you. We're, we're looking. Have a have a better life for you and your children. Um, you get Colombian, some Colombian ex-military, Guatemalan ex-military. Um, you know, when people find out, you know, get away. You no, know, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll pay for that expertise. Wow. Do you think they're intermingling in our politics yet? Uh, I haven't seen that in terms of U.S. politicians, like, uh, like, yeah. I mean, and in, in Mexico, you know, there, there's a huge capture of, of politics by drug cartels. So we could talk about narco politics, narco politicians. I mean, it would be. I'm not going to say it would be simple, but China is definitely involved in American politics. I don't see why the cartels. I mean, they're obviously intertwined, you mm-hmm. know, somewhat. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the way it is in I mean in Mexico, um, so in Mexico that's also evolved the way they're running politics in Mexico. So for a long time it was like the cartel 
bribes, you know, a mayor bribes a police chief to move. Then the cartels get stronger and they start to get more powerful at a local level than, than mayors and police chiefs. And they start to say, you have to work for us. And we're going to take 10% of your budget. So like 10% of the city budget has to go to the cartel. This is a bunch of towns across Mexico. And then you see cases where they start working with the bigger party at a federal level. Then they start saying, okay, we'll deliver votes for you. So we'll use our armed groups to be intimidating people to vote for you. Uh, you know, and, 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 and then you have also kind of cutting out the middle man and actually have cartel guys themselves who are really the politicians, who are really the, the kind of gangsters who get into politics. I mean, famously, obviously Pablo Escobar, you know, ran for Congress. And, um, so you see, you see that, that reach and that power and that influence. Now at a US level, and I haven't seen it, um, it's, it's possible in the long term, definitely. It's something to watch out for. Uh, and you've got to watch out for this stuff. You can start at like local levels. And then, but it, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, I mean, in terms of, so in terms of China, you know, they're, 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 they're working together, but like, you know, to, to think about strategically about like how you, you know, like how you'd actually start taking over politicians or, or bribing or paying money to their campaigns. I mean, it's possible these guys are moving a lot of money. Uh, they're obviously buying a, some of them buying a lot of real estate in the United States. I mean, well. I would think it would actually, you know, now that we're on the subject, I would think it would be very simple for them to breach into American politics. Mm. With the amount of money that they have, the billions and billions, I mean, they've got to have trillions by now, right? Well, to pump that into, yeah. if they were to move, it, it, whether it's an American or a Latin American running for office, they can pump so much money into that, into a local campaign. You know, I, I would think it would be relatively simple to 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 mm. take it. Yeah, I guess I guess like when when they're like running like a in, in Mexico. You got very clear objectives of what you can get from that, from from that mayor, from from that governor. So you want to control or influence that state, so they're going to allow you know, you know, all kinds of things from you know, from from turning a blind eye on all your all your drug loads and all your stuff going through to actually the police working for you as, as hitmen picking people up. You know, you want somebody picked up, you use the local police, the police are lookouts, and they become incorporated with the cartel. I guess, like, I mean, you know, there, there have been cases uh, of, say, some of these small towns, some of the ones to watch out for, like, where there's, like, some of the small towns in, like, on the border, um, where you start to see people with, on, on cartel payrolls there. What would your next step be if you, if you were a cartel looking to infiltrate the U.S.? Where would you start? Um, I would say, yeah. I mean, you know, some of the some of the some of these small towns where they're moving stuff through, where they have operations. Well, I mean, they're, they're, so we, we can see some cases there. Some of the towns, you know, little towns where there's where there was, um, uh, say, so police officers, police chiefs, some of, some of these small towns. Um, there, because that gives you actually operational stuff, operational useful stuff. Border patrol officers at lower levels. Um, can you start, you know, infiltrating higher ups, moving up the chains there? Yeah. Um, federal agents. I mean, there have been, you know, federal agents taking taking bribes, obviously. But again, it's still nothing compared to. to I mean, it's, it's still, I guess, hard to break the kind of the kind of federal agents in the same way they've managed to do in Mexico. Well, that's that's good. <laughs> <laughs> At least we have that going for us. Yeah. You know, but. <clears throat> Well, let's get into some of the fentanyl stuff you've been talking about. So at the beginning of this interview, you said you went to a port mm -hmm. and all the fentanyl was coming in through one of these ports on the, on the Pacific side, I believe mm. you said, from China. Mm. Yeah, so, so to talk about, I was going to talk about the, the revolution. I'd say to understand what's happening now, we can look at a revolution that's happened in Mexican drug trafficking the last 15 years but particularly the last five years and it's accelerating the last three years. 
So for a long time, we had plant-based drugs being the way that drug traffickers move their product. So they, you know, you get farmers in Colombia growing coca leaves, farmers in Mexico, Guerrero, Sinaloa, Michoacan, growing marijuana and growing opium poppers, which they make to heroin. So you've got a, a chain, you can look at the chain. They grow it out, and the chain's quite long and quite invulnerable, but you know, the money keeps on coming in, there's always this attempt to do this. So f- pharmaceuticals revolutionized this. Do you know they didn't have this chain anymore? Now there's a guy, a very interesting guy to look at in this evolution, Chinese guy called Shen Li Yigong. What's his name? Shen Li Yigong. Now Shen Li Yigong was a, Ch- a guy born in China who moved to Mexico and was a pharmaceutical entrepreneur. The accusation was that he was bringing, in that time, the precursors for crystal meth. Setting the precursors to Sinaloa cartel traffickers from the Beltran Leva organization. And that was then being made into crystal meth and trafficked in the United States. This grew particularly in 2005, after in the United States they started clamping down on crystal meth, which bikers have been making and stuff, with a thing called the Combat Methamphetamine Act. So he goes down to Mexico, and this guy starts bringing it in and selling it to the, the, the drug cartels, and it's a big boom. Now, they bust his house in Mexico City in 2007, and they found in cash $207 million in cash. $205 million in dollars, and a couple of million in pesos, euros, Hong Kong dollars, other stuff. The biggest drug cash bust in world history. You know, like imagine that much cash being found. So kind of crazy thing, they bust all this cash. He then, you know, ran, he was up in Las Vegas where he was bringing money to Vegas. He was going up to Vegas with suitcases full of cash and like gambling in, in Vegas. Kind of crazy stuff. I was working with the agency AP at the time when this happened and we actually ended up through a reporter doing an interview with him while he was in the United States which is kind of crazy interview. We sent, we sent people who spoke Spanish, English, and Chinese, and he spoke all three with an accent and had this kind of crazy thing and made it through his accusations. Bit of a crazy story of injury, but he was eventually extradited to Mexico. The Chinese government wouldn't cooperate with a bunch of documents and stuff. They were going to charge him in the US as well. The Chinese government wouldn't co- cooperate, moved to Mexico. He's still in prison in Mexico. Hasn't been fully sentenced yet. This is, caught in, you know, this is going back you know, 15 years, this case, and he still hasn't been fully sentenced yet. But he was a pioneer. He saw the opportunities. Bring in chemicals, forget about growing weed in the mountains, growing opium poppies, growing coca leaves, bring in chemicals, cook them up in the labs, do it that way. Profits are enormous. The profits can be massive. You've got less links in the chain. You can just make unlimited amounts of this stuff. Okay, fast forward, you start getting the recipes for fentanyl. Now, the problem is with fentanyl as well. You look into this fentanyl, it's not like one formula. There's like, this is like more than a thousand different formulas, different types of fentanyl. All the different formulas around it. Yeah. So first of all, you know, you get fentanyl, again, making it in China. First, they just, you know, bring in full-on fentanyl. Then China starts to ban some types so they can switch around and they ban more types under pressure from Trump. But it's still coming out of China. And I mean, there was a report on this, a congressional report on this. They said, okay, it's still being made in China. And the Chinese chemists are going to India and setting up labs in India and making it there. Now, I went to Manzanillo's biggest container port in, in Mexico. Huge amounts of containers coming in. Some of the problems with this is, first of all, You've got this like on, on a, a bill of lading, they've got like some pharmaceutical coming in from China, it can say something, it could be something else. You don't know it is what it says. And you've got a couple of you know, millions of crates coming through mm-hmm. this port. Then, if they stop and check and stuff, they do these kind of certain things, they have to stop. It's like going through this stuff and then find it, kind of identifying this stuff as being, you know, if you know where to search. 
So, you know, there's other ways of avoiding it. Like sometimes they bring a ship over, they can throw it off the ship. Uh, they call it like, uh, uh, they, have, they have a word for it, uh, like a sucker fish, these kind of fish that which grab onto a bigger fish and can take a ride with them. So they have like a separate containers on the big ship and take it out. But the people told me there, people I talked to, so there's intermediaries at the port who will take $40,000 to pass containers through. Intermediaries working with customs authorities. $40,000 your container goes through. How, how much, do you have any idea how much one container of whatever substances are in there to make fentanyl, how, how much fentanyl could one container make? I mean, you know... It, it's got to be... I mean, one, that's the thing about nothing about fentanyl. See, fentanyl is revolutionary in this because the stuff is just so potent. Like a tiny amount of this mm -hmm. is real strong. So like before, you know, years back we had marijuana, these big old bales of marijuana. You know, you know, shipping container of marijuana is only so much weed. And then we got like cocaine and heroin, which is stronger. And then, but now fentanyl and then crystal meth and then fentanyl is like, you know, it's a tiny amount. So... You know, one container. If you had, if you had a whole container packed with fentanyl, that would just be colossal amounts. But it's 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 distributed around different different containers. Yeah. And stuff. But the amounts that are coming through now. So you look really, the big changes have been. I mean, this is gradually building up, and it's building up, and it's very close. The build up of these amount of uh, synthetics coming through Mexico is very closely correlated to the drug overdose deaths in the United States. I mean, look at the numbers. And, and this, you know, the, the overdose epidemic in the United States is, is absolutely nuts. I think, you know, we know about this, but still, I don't think it's had the political impact that it will have, considering the scale of it. When I was first doing this, you know, 2000, I first started covering this stuff, it was like 15,000 overdose deaths in the year in the United States, between legal and illegal drugs. 2021, 107,000. So like eightfold increase. You know, like really, you know, yeah. really. It's 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 completely spiraled out of control. Yeah. And there's no end in sight. Yeah. Um, sevenfold increase, eightfold increase. <laughs> Whatever. Huge increase, 100, 150,000 to 107,000. Um. Uh, and you can see this, this particularly, it's accelerated particularly really big figures the last couple of years, right as you've had the increases in, in the in the synthetics coming through Mexico. Now, the amount of fentanyl, you suddenly saw a shift. So if you saw a change from more crystal meth than cocaine, and they're both like uppers in terms of drugs, and more fentanyl than heroin, which are both kind of downers. And then, I mean, the numbers, I mean, again, I mean, you know, people, when people do talk about it in terms of like weapons of mass destruction, I can see, a, you know, you can see a truth to that or, or poison coming over the border because it is colossal amounts mm -hmm. of fentanyl coming over. And now the lethality is like, how much, how much can they move? It's so easy to know, it's like, you know, it doesn't matter how many, you, know, you don't need to worry about how many fields you've got and how many fields are being crop sprayed. You can just churn this stuff out, churn this stuff out, churn this stuff out. Um, it seems like they've you know saturated the market now, or like uh, what you know you know what when you have one hundred seven thousand dying a year does that kill off addicts and there's less addicts left to die? Um, but you know we're 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 in the eye of the storm right now. I don't know if they are. I don't know if it is just addicts anymore because I mean, the, the one thing that I don't understand is why fentanyl, why they're putting that in every drug they're putting it in marijuana they're putting it in cocaine they're putting it in meth they're putting it in ecstasy they're putting it in mdma they're they're it's you know i hate to say it this way but you know as a kid growing up kids are going to experiment they are it's just mm -hmm. going to happen you know nowadays you can't you can there is no experimenting with drugs because you might you <laughs> There's a good possibility you're going to overdose because everything seems to be laced with fentanyl, you know. And so, it's it's. I don't think it's just these <clears throat> uh, addicts dying anymore. I think it's it's first time users. It's people experimenting for the first time with particular drugs. It's 
you know, and, and like we talked about before, too, they're weaponizing it. They're, I'm seeing more and more cops being killed or overdosed uh, from fentanyl, you know, being used as a weapon. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's a very good question about, like, why they're putting it in cocaine. You know, they put in heroin because people, people want the heroin, they want the buzz. You know, you talk to people who, who use fentanyl, you know, one guy who was a guy who's fed through and described it was kind of the high you're looking for. If you're kind of, you know, if you're an opioid addict, if you've got the addiction to that drug, that's the high you're looking for. Uh, you know, and then they put it in heroin and, 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 and you know, starts, it's, it's better, more money for them and people are wanting that high. But then it turns up in cocaine. And then you get cases of people who are kind of calling up cocaine. There's a case in New York, a case in Texas. People call, phoning up lines to get cocaine and they're like you know musicians people with money you know kind of you know yuppies who are still like you know buying some cocaine and uh you know get it and they die of overdoses of fentanyl it's like why what, what's the incentive so i heard like you know asking a lot of people this why are they doing this you know um i haven't got a good answer you know one theory somebody put out was you're messing up rivals. You're deliberately, deliberately messing up rivals. You know, you know your rivals have got a load there, and you're throwing some some hmm. fentanyl in there, cocaine, kind of made, feeding them that to mess them up. Possibly doesn't really kind of don't really bite that much. Another one is like cross contamination. That like you're in a lab, it's kind of some messy lab, and you've got some fentanyl kicking around, uh, and you've got some cocaine kicking around. You cross contaminate. They don't really buy that. Um. But like, oh, yeah, I mean, deliberately poisoning people. Um, you know, who's doing that and why? I, I don't see the cartels are interested in making money on selling drugs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make a lot of, uh, I mean, in, I asked that question of like, you know, would it stop them? Do they, you know, is fentanyl bad for their business? Basically? Are you killing off your user base? I don't really think it's just thinking short term, it may make big money. Uh, but it doesn't seem like they, they obviously want to poison, you know, like, you know, throw poison out there. Um, so, yeah, it, it's kind of it's kind of nuts. Uh, and we're kind of at a pretty, pretty crazy thing. So we start to look at look, how, how can you deal with this? How can you deal with the, with the level of fentanyl now? And is it going to force? I think it, I think this, this might become a hotter political issue if it doesn't change. Are people going to change their practices and like you're going to force people to say, we're going to stay away from these these kind of pills now. Is there going to be some kind of reaction in the population? Um, is the, you know they talk about harder, much harder punishments and charging? They started doing this now, charging drug dealers with murder, and and, and start going back to kind of big incarceration. And maybe if that happens, we'll see if if that really happens or not. You know that, but uh, but yeah, I mean, what are, what are the options there for for actually for changing? It's a pretty hard situation right now. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I, th I would think you would start with a border, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, absolutely. And, and like, I mean, look, you know, this is, um, you know, it's, it, it uh, you know, the, these guys are committing horrific amounts of murder, both in Mexico, in terms of people they're killing with bullets, and in the United States, in terms of people who are dying with overdoses. And this stuff's this stuff's horrific. But would like how how do you the problem with the border is, in terms of enforcing and stopping drugs coming over the border. So, like most of the drugs coming over the border, the high value drugs come over in vehicles. They used to do a lot of walking marijuana, you know, walking backpacks of marijuana, like right over, particularly the Sonora Desert, it was a big area, you walk over with marijuana, a lot of that. Um, but now marijuana kind of markets collapsed. There still is some marijuana coming over, but now it's kind of collapsed because you've legalized marijuana in a bunch of US states. So the amount of marijuana now moving up is a lot less than before because they can grow here. But they don't really, because uh, like walking people over the border with, they call them, they call them burros, like donkeys. It's this walk over. It used to be like two different packs, 25 kilo pack or like a 50 kilo pack. Like, we'd, we'd, like 25 kilo or, or double 50 kilo. You walk right over the border with that. Um, and you lose a lot, but you don't care because you're making money and, you know, and it's weed. Mm-hmm. But the high value drugs go generally in vehicles. There's other different ways you've got, and tunnels, tunnels coming under. 
catapults. They, you seen, seen, seen the catapults there? Like massive, like military siege weapons. Like throw catapults these trucks over the border. I have, I've not seen that one yet. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's crazy. But the, the, the big amount, okay, is vehicles. So you look at the, the vehicles crossing. And uh, Nuevo Laredo, Laredo border, it's about 10,000 trucks a day crossing. Uh, you've got, you know, Juarez, Tijuana, just lines of cars all the time. Now, fentanyl particularly is like very, very potent. You have a small amount. So how many cars can you search? You know, you start looking at this stuff. I mean, you know, they had this, this, this feeder. You, you've had this, this, these border agents there for years or, or customs. And, you know, you talk to a customs guy who's, who's good and, and who's got like a human, and can spot people, look at them. And he's got a good eye for seeing, okay, this guy's nervous, got some. But then you stop a vehicle. Now, that sometimes, you know, they call them trap cars. In, in, in Spanish, they call them clavos. You have secret compartments. It'd be very good secret compartments sometimes. You've got a lot of very complicated ways of opening them. So you've got to find a car. Sometimes you've got to, like, tear the car apart. Now, you, you tear a car apart, it's the wrong car. But not just the, the fact, okay, you're tearing apart the wrong car. It's just like you've got your agents doing that, spending, like, an hour, two hours messing around with a car. Other vehicles are coming through. When you, you know, you do find, okay, you find, you bust a load. Okay, great, you bust a load. Someone's they'll bust a load and they'll say to the person, okay, you want to do 20 years or do we follow you to where you're dropping it off and then we'll go and bust them. Kind of classic tactic. But even when they bust a load and they kind of bust them, do the paperwork, whatever, other loads are coming through. Now, I talked to, one guy who's in prison in the United States, in North Carolina, for trafficking cocaine. And he, I said, how much of your cocaine did you lose? I mean, it was a couple of years ago. Remember, I, I thought maybe they lost half of it. They could still make huge amounts of money. He's like, we lost about 20%. So for every one load that is getting bust, you've got four loads coming through. So how much, how much are you going to really stop this stuff? And it's so potent and there's so much money being made and they can afford to lose it. So they're still busting a bunch of this stuff now, but are you really going to stop it? The only way to, you really would stop it is if you really wanted to kind of just transform the border completely, but you've got half a trillion dollars worth of legitimate trade going back and forth over the border. Yeah. You so, know, it almost seems like it would be in their best interest to just produce it here. Produce it in the United States? Yeah. I mean, I... I don't know what compounds make fentanyl, but, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they might find a way. I mean, right now, because, I mean, like, there are people who are bringing, you know, some bits into the United States. But right now, the easy, it's easier for them to bring it. I mean, the, the real big industrial amounts they can make in Mexico and shift it over here. And that's working for them. Um, now, I mean, maybe, I mean, if you could have some new technology where you could kind of, like, have something so that, like, whenever you went over the border, you could detect drugs in a vehicle, but it, it, it's like practically to try and be able to shut down the border and stop the fentanyl coming across. I mean, like, how come they haven't been able to stop drugs coming to the United States for the last 40 years? Yeah. Um, and unless you want to search every single vehicle, you know, like strip down and rip up every single vehicle, which means that nobody can get across and, and trade shuts down. I guess it's just not that bad yet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, it is bad. It is terrible. I mean, it's, it's horrible. Ter- it is terrible. One hundred seven thousand overdose deaths. That is that is nuts. Um, yeah, yeah, that is nuts. You know, it's. I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know what the number is. I don't. You know how bad it's going to be, but it's it's. They're going to have to do something. Maybe mm. that is shut the border down completely. Who knows? But or check mm. every car. I don't, they're going to have to hire a ton of border patrol agents for that and do a major expansion. But I mean, it's it just seems like nothing is being done right now. Yeah, yeah. Nothing, you know. And like it, it doesn't even seem like it's. It it just seems like it's ramping up. Yeah, it's yeah. getting more and more and more is coming and more. Mm. It's becoming more prevalent in the media. And more and more overdoses are happening over the years, and it's just nothing is slowing this down. Yeah, look, look I would say this. Look, I mean, we're at a, uh, we're at a critical situation here. I mean, I, I mean, I, I've been kind of shouting this for years. You know, I mean, ten years ago, 
Um, and, and I could see, you know, when I start, when I first started doing, working on drug cartels, you know, I arrived in Mexico in 2000, start reporting in 2001. And then I started reporting, 2004, five, I started reporting this like turf war happened on the border with Texas. And I was like a young reporter. Um, and then this kind of crazy stuff started happening. I was like, fucking, this is a pretty, pretty kind of, kind of crazy story. Uh, I interviewed this, this guy who then became the police chief. And they asked him when he became the police chief, he said, are you, uh, are you scared? He said, I'm not scared, the corrupt people are scared. And he was shot six hours afterwards. Damn. And that was a kind of, in a time it was in a story, it was kind of an interesting story regionally. It was a, I was working for the Houston Chronicle out of Houston, Texas. And it was like, okay, wow, I'm like, um, you know, this is interesting. This is, you know, this is a kind of big story. The, the, the Texas newspaper started having a bit of a turf battle about that. And then this spread, and I was covering a lot of Sinaloa in 2008, 2009. And I remember it was in 2008, and I was covering this, this scene of a massacre. And there'd been okay, two massacres in this, in this little village. Bullets are still over there. And the residents of the village were just leaving the village in a convoy of trucks. I was seeing this scene of this like convoy of trucks. And it was like, wow, this is like, so this is like refugees. You know, something big is happening in this country. It's going to tear this country apart. When I wrote, you know, pitched for the first book about this. And like, you know, a couple of years later, yeah, you know, things I was wondering, am I, you know, am I overstating this? Am I kind of exaggerating this thing? It's just a bunch of gangsters. No, no, it is destabilizing, you know, destabilize the country. So you kind of see this stuff creeping up and kind of getting bigger. Um, now I would say now, and, 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 I, and I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I don't want to say like, say that there's nothing you can do about this stuff. I mean, human beings, we could do stuff. You know, we put man, men on the moon. You know, we build, you know, we found, you know, hospitals and, um, you know, we can, we can create and, and do amazing things. So how come we can't deal with these problems? How come our politics is broken? Yeah, it's, 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 when I say there's no effort, I mean, it's, yeah. we're not going to declare them a terrorist organization. Yeah. We're not going to do anything about the border. Mm. We're not going to unleash our border patrol agents. Yeah, yeah. We're going to put all these stipulations on them and paint them out to be, I don't know, bad people. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And nothing is happening. Yeah, yeah, Nothing's yeah, sure. happening. Yeah, it doesn't not- seem like there's any pressure being put on the Mexican government. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, there's a lot of different angles that mm. I, th- I feel like they could, they could go with here that, you know, other than just the border, but nobody has done anything. No, I agree. I agree. I think, I think uh, I would say, um, you know, we, we have we have to try and come together and work out. Now, I would say it's like, it's a really horrible situation and it's not an easy button which is going to make this go away. Mm-hmm. But we have to kind of think about long-term stuff because we have to think about our children, grandchildren, you know, you know, people who have got like kids now who are one, what's going to be like when they're 15, 20? Um, you know, what's it like for, for, for the people's grandchildren to grow up with this? So I, I would say... Um, and look at like, I would say you have to, you know, you, politics is kind of broken. And also the government, you have a lot of these different government departments with different agendas. It's like, how do you create a unified policy for dealing with this? How do you look at like, uh, and it is a question, I think, of, of the United States security, you know, and being the neighbor, because a lot of these things tie together. Why do people flee Mexico, flee Central America? Because of the violence. Um, why do, you know, like, you suddenly get the Pentagon involved because the Pentagon started seeing, um, you know, very, very heavily armed groups right over the border. Um, you know, so you've got really different things. I would say um, you have to look at the law enforcement point of view. Uh, you have to look at the kind of crime prevention. Then you have to look at, like, stopping giving the money. So yeah, looking at the law enforcement point of view, it has to be, yeah, I mean, you, you've got to take this seriously. Um, I, I, think, I think in terms of, of, of like how US law enforcement, I think with a lot of people, a lot of skilled people that have come through the DEA and stuff, you need to think, look at it more of like, this is organized crime and how this organized crime is a risk to us in the long term. And how we've got to try to hit them hard and break them up now before they start doing in the US what they're doing in Mexico. Because in a few years that could come. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would worry about that, not just about the border, but about 
how they're building up in cities. I'm talking to a guy from MS-13 um, uh, in Honduras. And he was running, he'd been running a clique up in Maryland. And they had uh, these cliques are like chapters. What's yeah. a clique? A clique is like a chapter of the gang. Okay. They call them a clique or la clica. So the, ch- the, the, the chapter might have uh, 30 to 100 members in a, in a chapter. But then they have what they call sympathizers or sympathizers. They have sympathizers who are the, like the periphery members. And they'd have like 500 sympathizers. And they got a lot of these things like schools up in Maryland, where they had a bunch of these like recruited members and sympathizers around building up there. And then started doing things like shakedowns inside the immigrant community. So started doing shakedowns, but then they started recruiting people. These are MS-13s, the Salvadoran gang originally. Then they grew up, you know, Hondurans, and then they suddenly got Dominicans and Cubans. They said they had like Chinese members. You know, Chinese immigrants are recruited in, in his MS-13 cliques. They have Chinese members. Yeah, like Chinese members, these MS-13 cliques up in the, like what's become like growing up in the, in the, um, on the West Coast, sorry, in the East Coast there. So, the, uh, you know, I think, I think the thing hard about like um, organized crime, um, I mean, the United States historically fought very hard about organized crime. Um, with RICO and this kind of thing, because people understand the, the, the danger of organised crime, what it can mean, and I would I would concern, I would put that as an alert in terms of the, uh, in terms of that, in terms of like uh, law enforcement, but in terms of reducing um, the demand, I mean, may, maybe you know it does have to be very hard, you know, with fentanyl. I mean, I don't know the answer, but maybe it is true. You need very hard sentences for fentanyl dealers at a local level. Uh, and But also the work on rehab, why are so many people now like using this stuff? Like what's happened to society that so many people are now becoming like, you know, have got, you know, opioid problems. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a mix of stuff, yeah? You know, you got to, you know, sometimes there's people who have come, you know, vets who have come back and been prescribed Mm-hmm. Drugs and then ended up buying stuff in the black market and and buying pills out there. Um, there's some real deep problems there. How like can we get like fix and have people's helps so they don't have this like this like wanting this this amount of drugs. That's a good point. It's a it's going to be a tough problem to solve if it ever does get solved. <laughs> but let's take a quick break. I want to give a big thank you out right now to all the Vigilance Elite patrons out there that are watching the show right now. Just want to say thank you guys. You are our top supporters and you're what makes this show actually happen. If you're not on Vigilance Elite Patreon, I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on in there. So, we do a little bit of everything. There's plenty of behind the scenes content from the actual Sean Ryan show. On top of that, basically what I do is I take a lot of the questions that I get from you guys or the patrons and then I turn them into videos. So we get, right now, there's a lot of concern about self-defense, home defense, crimes on the rise all throughout the country, actually all throughout the world. And so we talk about everything from how to prep your home, how to clear your home, how to get familiar with a firearm, both rifle and pistol for beginners and advanced. We talk about mindset. We talk about defensive driving. We have an end of the month live chat that I'm on at the end of every month where we can talk about whatever topics you guys have. It's actually done on Zoom. You might enjoy it. Check it out. And if Zoom's not your thing or you don't like live chats, like I said, there's a library of well over a hundred videos on where to start with prepping, all the firearm stuff, pretty much anything you can think of, it's on there. So anyways, go to www.patreon.com slash vigilance elite, or just go in the link in the description. It'll take you right there. And if you don't want to, and you just want to continue to watch the show, that's fine too. I appreciate it either way. Love you all. Let's get back to the show. 
Thank you. I'll say this, the first thing that comes to mind is I had no idea how many people in this world live in fear all the time. All the time. Tonight, the sheriff here revealing the worsening toll, at least 59 now dead. What's your opinion on why is this happening? The mass shooting in Buffalo, at least 10 people were killed. We took some kids who had just grown up and never handled weapons, but grew up on first-person shooter games, mm -hmm. and they were dead. Screen time stimulates the release of the brain chemical dopamine. We're expecting people to look as unhuman as possible. I see a lot of my friends dying because of suicide. Yeah. Because they're unhappy. And, uh, and now I see that spilling out into the masses. These messages were released on social media, and he, he felt just absolutely humiliated. And he couldn't face that humiliation at school that was awaiting him the next day. That's a child. You know, this is what everyone on TikTok, you know what I mean? And he doesn't know what's happening to his brain by watching that trash all day long. When high schoolers get phones that disrupt their sleep, subsequently they go on to have higher rates of depression. The climate's going to kill us in 25 years. The Republicans are going to kill us in 25 years. China's going to kill us in 14 years. Russia's going to kill us. The, the only news that makes its way through our ecosystem is, it ends here. All right, we're back from the break, and uh, you were just telling me about a gunfight that happened along the, was it the Arizona border? Yeah, yeah, sure. So to get a, uh, an idea of what this cartel control looks like, and the way they're controlling information on the Mexican side of the border. You can look at this, uh, this one town on the Mexican side of the Arizona-Sonora border. And there was a gunfight in 2019 when a group of cartel uh, hitmen, about 60, came into the city from over the, line, over the state, Mexican state lines in Chihuahua State and, and came in to try and attack and seize the territory of this town in Mexico. And the local cartel sicarios responded and there was this crazy gunfight. I mean, it's impossible to know the true number of dead, but it could well have been over 30 according to witnesses I talked to. So to get a sense though of what really happened, I mean, the, the border was shut down on the night of this gunfight, you know, in this small border town, they shut down the border. But the cartel was very concerned about controlling that information and they're not going out there. There'd been such a severe gunfight. Why? Because they, you go see this small town on the border where they're moving drugs through, moving people through. And you can see a certain neighborhood with a bunch of cartel houses. Some quite obvious big houses that stand out in the kind of dirt streets and some of these real big houses. They have various houses they use like safe houses or cartel properties. Now, if there's a big noise about a gunfight on the border with 30 dead and it became a big story and like Fox News and stuff, that creates heat. Okay. So the Mexican government's like, hey, what do we do? Send the army in. What options do you have? Send in the military. So the military goes in and it has to bust, you know, break down some doors until you've got some houses to bust. So the cartel is interested in trying to keep things down. So what they did is they tell, they control the local journalists and they tell the local journalists, you're not reporting on this or you're only reporting two dead. Um, we want no information. We're even harassing social media operators in these areas as well. And this was basically hushed up. And, uh, you know, we, we were in there, we were, we were following this as part of, a, of an investigative series. And I had to go into this town and, and, and try and deal with the cartel members in this town. Who, who, you know, first didn't want us filming there and were very aggressive and we tried to try to talk to them. Tried to sit down and talk to these cartel people. So we only want to film and document this. It's old now. You know, it's happened now. But still, they're very, very controlling of what can be filmed and what can be said in this town. And that shows kind of some of the motivations and why they like, 
on top of journalists while they're harassing journalists. And you see there's one journalist uh, there in this town who, uh, you know, we, we were talking to him and we actually got him to help us introduce us to some of these cartel members. But he uh, he was talking to us about it and then he started broke out in tears and said, like, you know, we, we, we can't, can't tell the news here. We got this, you know, they're breathing down our necks, you know, we've got this car, they're ordering us what we can say and we can't say. And, and you see that with the level of murder of journalists yeah. in Mexico the last 20 years, with more than 150 journalists who have been murdered. And it's often for not, for not doing what the cartels, they want to have control of the media, especially in these small towns, in these places, say what they can say, what they can't say. You can't say this name of a cartel. You can't say this. You've got to report this massacre. You shouldn't report this, and then and then can lead to, to murders if anything falls out of line, or if they see as the reporters working with a different cartel, or responding to a different cartel, that can also put them in danger. Man, they're just <laughs> controlling every little aspect. It's, yeah, it's yeah. really. What are some of the? We had talked a little earlier. I think it was last night actually at dinner. We were talking. And you were just, we were talking about some of the brutality that these guys are doing. We talked about it a little bit today, you know, getting 12 year olds to cut up bodies. You were talking about a dog yesterday that mm. ate a man's genitals off. Do you want, can you, what is the point of this? And what are, what are some of the most horrific things that you've seen or heard these guys doing? Yeah, yeah, sure. The reason I'm asking is I want to paint a picture of just how brutal. Yeah, these yeah. guys are to the audience. Sure thing, yeah. So I think the kind of public displays of violence, um, you saw this escalating, and, and it began, okay, if we go all the way back to 2004, and there was then that year was the de decapitation in Iraq of um, by al Sakawi, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Mm -hmm. 2004 or 5 I think 2004 and that was shown um, fully on Mexican TV I remember seeing on Mexican news and they show that fully that kind of that video and they, they, the Mexican newscast saying oh we'll show you and, it, and, it, and, that was, and that had an impact and that was seen by the cartels okay decapitation and you, you start seeing that in, in, in Iraq the kind of rise in, in, in this kind of terror and violence and decapitation, but using it publicly. Mm -hmm. Then the first time you start seeing it in Mexico was 2006. There was one incident, for the first incident, where there was some police officers who shot up some cartel guys in Acapulco, and the cartel went and decapitated two of these cops, put their heads on the wall. Like, you don't, don't fuck with our guys. So the idea is again, you're kind of copying and seeing this stuff on TV from Iraq and stuff and like copying this terror. Then there was a, one of the first splatter videos was around this time. It was on a, the first, one of the first splatter videos back then was on a VHS tape. And they, 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 they interrogate a guy and at the end of the interrogation they shoot the guy in the head. And they threw it, they sent it, they sent it by mail. Back then, they, it was a video that was done from Acapulco. They sent it by mail to, to a newspaper in the United States. They ended up getting, getting, getting reported and stuff, and it's kind of showing this kind of, we're, we're using kind of recording stuff on video and doing this stuff, kind of copying this kind of terror tactics mm -hmm. to try and incite terror in our enemies. Now, you then had in Michoacan, a guy called Nazario Moreno, El Mas Loco, the maddest one. And he, um, they chopped off five heads and they rolled them into a disco. And when this came out, I was working again at the news agency AP at the time. Uh, we got sent a video of this from a local stringer of the five heads just sitting on this disco floor, five decapitated heads. And the TV was like, come look at this. I was like, wow, this is kind of crazy. And she's like, oh, we're not going to put it out on the wire. We're not going to put it out on, on, our, on our wire, meaning our, the news agency feed mm -hmm. that like TV, you know, it's a bit too brutal. 
Well, one Japanese, funny enough, one Japanese TV company said, oh, we want particularly that video, we want to have that. And it was this idea of terror, and it started escalating. So then it was like two heads, five heads, then it became 12 heads, then up 14, 18, and got to that episode of 49 bodies. And it became competing for who could be you know, the, the, the baddest cartel. The way of competing was, was, was having this violence and having this, this kind of public displays of violence and stuff on videos. And you start having this stuff on the internet. Now, initially as journalists, I'll say both as, as, as journalists working for international media reporting on this and the local Mexican media, we didn't know quite how to handle this stuff. It's like, report it, you know, report this stuff out. Then you realize, okay, you, are you speaking for the cartel? Are you only showing their propaganda by doing this stuff? They've, they've got a message. Sometimes they have like decapitated heads and a message, you know, on a blanket expressing this stuff. Uh, and then you, you know, you, so you start to get like a bit of a kickback of, okay, we shouldn't really report on this. Should we try and... and I, remember, I remember, but it's kind of sad. I remember one day at, at the AP and they said, well, we're no longer report on episodes of just decapitated heads unless there's a very high number or something special because there's been so many, it's no longer news anymore. So now that it kind of loses that shock value. So nowadays you could hear, oh, there's five decapitated heads in Mexico. It doesn't, you know, you're not going to get, you're going to just go, oh, right. At the time, at the beginning, this was something which is really causing yeah. an impact. I would say it kind of reached that public use of violence, reached a peak around that time, around like 2000, 2012 was the 49 bodies. Maybe around, that was the highest number. I said there was a massacre of 72 people, but that was a bit different. That wasn't a public, you know, the 49 was, we're gonna cut, kill 49 people, cut their heads and hands and feet off and dump them in one place. And that was the kind of peak, I think, of that, of the brutality of that very, very public violence. There's a bunch of other incidents, I mean, like they'd, cut off a face and sewed it onto a, a soccer ball and, and like, you know, just cut up bodies and carve them in all kinds of different ways you can imagine. But it kind of reached a peak of public violence. It started, kind of lose, lost its shock value and the press kind of, start, st kind of stopped reporting on it so much. So you had less of that public violence. Now, one thing I mentioned yesterday, a kind of brutal incident, was you, you have a change and you have uh, violence then, it's a different objective a kind of policing of local communities and the cartels, because they're coming like, becoming like warlords and imposing a policing on the populations. So then you're saying like, um, okay, you know, the other cartels saying, oh, no one can steal from people's houses. No one can commit rape. Hmm. Um, people can't kidnap. Actually, I went to uh, one crime scene where they, they killed some alleged kidnappers. And they had like a thing saying like, you know, a sign saying that kidnappers, you can't do that here. Get to work. It's in the lowest style, meaning it's okay, traffic drugs, work. Don't kidnap people. So they start, because they're, they're, they're kind of the absence of, and the failure of the, of the rule of law, they're becoming like the rule of law, like the warlords and imposing that. Now, what we mentioned last night, which is a very brutal video, was somebody who's accused of rape in a, in a town in the state of Mexico. And uh, they put a dog on, 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 his, on his genitals and put something and, 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 and ate his genitals and, and put a video of that and put that video out. Like, you can't rape in our territory. Kind of pretty, pretty brutal, again, kind of medieval yeah. kind of control. Did they kill him? Not as far as we know. I mean, the guy was left maybe alive, but alive, but mutilated. Well, he's not going to reproduce. Yeah. <laughs> so... <clears throat> it's, it seems like, you know, I've interviewed a couple of guys about this stuff. Started with Ed Calderon, then I moved yeah. in to Luis. He actually, he actually recommended you, and then and then now you. And it's it, it seems to be the common theme that they're just getting more brutal, more ruthless, more graphic. You know, and it, and, and and it seems like they're really trying to, you know, instill that fear into everyone. Local yeah. population, the police, uh, U.S., everybody. Yeah, I mean, I would say, like, um, I mean, in some ways, say that very, very public displays of violence kind of, in some ways, reached a peak. 
and went down. And a lot of the videos you've seen more recently have been these big shows of firepower. So you've seen an escalation with that. So first of all, you start off with a guy, you know, you'd have uh, you know, five guys with ski masks and AK-47s going, you know, here we are, you know, we're the cartel. And then you kind of have that, you know, make it big and have, you know, 20 guys with metal helmets and, and then it becomes 50 guys. And it's like a big like film of a convoy of armored vehicles and grenade launchers and everything going, ah, and it becomes bigger and bigger. Mm-hmm. So there's like an escalation in that show of force becomes like a new thing in terms of the kind of propaganda war. There's also like the carrot as well as the stick. So there's like handing out goods to the population as well for control. So like you have um, you you have like at the beginning of COVID, there was like suddenly there were you know they, suddenly it was like in you know, a pandemic lockdown. Um, they went and started handing out packages to people, and I went to one community where they'd had a handout. And it was a couple of hours from Mexico City. And they'd gone to this, this one village. And they just like, the, you know, a bunch of guys drew up in some pickup trucks. And they'd handed out everyone a bag of goods. And I talked to a family, you know, a couple of families who, who, who'd received, you know, some of these bags. And they were like, oh, they were good stuff. It was like good, you know, it wasn't cheap sugar. It was good, you know, good labels of sugar and eggs and flour and this kind of thing, kind of basic goods. Now, they don't necessarily give it to that many people considering the whole country and the level of population. But it has an impact because then they video that stuff and they put that out on video as well. They put it out on the, on, on, on the, on the airwaves, on the internet. And, and then that creates a kind of reaction, that creates a kind of thing of like saying, oh, well, we're kind of, you know, we're good guys as well, so you have a control that way as well. You're buying support in the population. Um, the same way that kind of politicians do as well. I'm going to give handouts and stuff in Mexico. It's been a big tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're kind of portraying yourself as, as good guys in a propaganda war. How many cartels are there in Mexico, estimation? So you have, in Mexico, you have, you, you've, you've had this, this process of fragmentation so there's more and more. So now you could talk about at least a dozen groups considering cartels but like from the bigger ones to some of the smaller ones and then below that a bunch of different factions and groups but there's different sizes and scales so there's two now the biggest ones which are really the bigger size than the rest which is the Sinaloa cartel and the Jalisco New Generation cartel and they're the both they're both you know big international organizations with you know with with very very big power Mm -hmm. but do they own these little smaller cartels are they like so satellites? With, within, within that, you have you have factions of these cartels. So they create like the Sinaloa cartel will have uh, an armed faction called La Gente Nueva. And there'll be like an armed paramilitary wing which operates in certain areas. Okay. Then you'll have like Los Salazares, which will be a certain family with their own people who like operate and work for the Sinaloa cartel. And within the Sinaloa cartel, you've got like Los Chapitos, El Mayo, and these different factions within them. Then the Jalisco New Generation cartel will take over these places and will often take over these smaller kind of towns and take over gangs and kind of create them and make them part of their organization. Then, though, you've got below the rung of those two most powerful cartels, you've got a bunch of, of still big, powerful regional forces. So going across the border, you have the Gulf Cartel, which is still a powerful international organization. The Gulf Cartel, Reynosa, Matamoros, you know, South Texas, and then they'll have people also in a bunch of places around Mexico. You go next, you have the Cartel de Noreste, the Northeast Cartel. Again, a powerful organization, formerly the Setas, they were. They kind of became now the Northeast, they rebranded themselves, the Northeast Cartel. They got a bunch of things, a bunch of guns, a bunch of different stuff operating around the place. You move across, you've got the Juarez Cartel, stroke La Linea, operating there. Then you've got more Sinaloa cartel territory and Jalisco New Generation cartel fighting, but then you've still got the remnants of the, of the Ariana Felix Tijuana cartel there. And then further south, you've got some, some significant organizations. Uh, you've got La Familia Michoacana, which is still operating in, in certain areas. Still, you've still got, um, you've got these groups called things like Los Rojos, Los Guerreros Unidos, which are quite significant in certain areas. 
And then, you, you know, sometimes I call some of these groups kind of cartelitos, like, like smaller, they kind of operate like cartels, but in, a, in an area. You suddenly have um, this group called the Independent Cartel of Acapulco. So they're, they're not international. Yeah, they're more like localized, but they're still, some of these groups can control several municipalities. But because one of the problems with this fragmentation is, so if you look at the, 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 the history of this, and you see you had these big efforts to kind of break some of these cartels with mixed motivations from above, whatever. They, they were taking out some of these top guys, Arturo Beltran Leva. So you had, you know, he was a break away from the Sinaloa cartel, the Beltran Leva cartel. Then he gets killed, and you start to fragment and break down. So then you start to get like Los Guerreros Unidos, Los Rojos, and these breakdowns from that. Then you get these kind of like local fights and these little breakoffs. So then you had um, the kind of fragments of the fragments of the fragments, the kind of break off of the break of the break off. Uh, but then it can be, still be these kind of crazy, crazy little organizations. There was a group, there was one guy called El Huero Palayo, with some guy in, in, in Guerrero State. He was like 20, early 20s maybe, and he had like hundreds of young you know, kids, teenagers and young kids with AK-47s and stuff kind of following him. And he controlled this kind of small bit of territory. Some colleagues, uh, were driving, that his group was burning vehicles, blockading roads is one of their strategies, one of their tactics, were, when they wanted to kind of stop convoys and stuff. And, and his journalists only went up there and they got stopped. And it was like a hundred of these kind of young oh. teenagers, you know, these kind of crazy kids, basically. Uh, some of them with guns and stuff and they, they took their cameras, laptops, one of the vehicles, cleaned them out. Um, and one colleague of mine, he said he had, he had his camera and, he, and the guy goes, give me your ID. I go, give, give, give me your wallet. So first of all, he tried to, try to show his ID and then he was like, and he was like, one, he was kind of seeing his kids. Oh. But like, so you get, so, so this part of the problem, it drives violence because then you get these kind of crazy fragmented groups and then they're like watching roads and fighting each other and fighting over like dumb, very local shit. I, I got a question. Yeah. So it, it sounds like, so you have the big entity. You have the Sinaloa cartel mm -hmm. and the what it, the new generation cartel. Yeah. And then you have all these basically, sounds like subsidiary companies of yeah. the cartel. Do these subsidiary companies, do they get along or are they rivals too? This sounds very tribal. Yeah, yeah. So you've got a, a, a bunch of shifting alliances. Do you, know what, do you know what I'm saying? So if you have the Sinaloa cartel here yeah. and then you have all these subsidiary companies underneath of it and then subsidiary companies do these subsidiary companies get along do they know like hey we're both under the Sinaloa okay. umbrella yeah, yeah so we don't conduct violence with each other we conduct violence with subsidiary companies of the new generation cartel or the zetas or yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very very good point i see i see exactly where you're coming from and the answer is no they don't they can they can so you get violence among different like localized gangs who are still working for a bigger organization and some of these groups are constantly fighting amongst themselves so there can be so there can be rivals within yeah with it yeah the, the entity intra cartel fighting so as is as efficient and as effective they are they still there's still a lot of yeah it, it's a very messy in, in, yeah totally within the organization yeah. a lot of yeah, and like I said, a lot, a lot of disruptors I mean, I mean they're, they're powerful they're not all powerful and they're, they're messy things um, you know, it's a very messy kind of whirlwind of this kind of world of organized crime and these figures rising and falling and stuff. I mean, they, they're exercising immense power, um, but at the same time, it, very unstable. Re reason I'm asking is because in Afghanistan, what we found in the earlier days um, was tribes. We would go in, try to get intelligence from a tribe, and what we found is they were given bad intel. because mm -hmm. So there were so many rivalries going on you know, for hundreds of years between these different tribes that U.S. would bomb villages or, 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 or targets or whatever it, whatever it is, you know, vehicles, because, simply because this tribe who had a rivalry with this tribe, which we didn't know, but they're basically saying, hey, this is who you're looking for. They're responsible for X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z. But the only reason they're telling us that is because of the 200-year 
Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. rivalry that's been going on. Yeah, yeah. And then they just had the U.S. take care of their enemy. I could see that exact problem. Mm. Say we did declare the cartels a, a a terrorist organization. I could, I can see us falling into that trap again, where it's it's not it's not solid intelligence that we're gathering. We're basically just finishing these guys as you know. Yeah, I mean, some of the violence going back a couple of generations, it was like about feuds. Um, and you talk, you know, some of the older guys, what well, the violence was like in the, in the 60s and 70s. And it was often feuds, family against family stuff. Um, Los Sanchez, Los Hernandez, these like families in these valleys. And it's like, you know, they're, 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 one of them um, robbed a woman. It's a classic one. They robbed a girl from another family. And then, 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 so they went there and they killed a bunch of the other family because of that. And so they went back and there was like a feud going on back and forth between them. And some of these feuds are still around. So then now there's these people becoming like part of these cartels and stuff, but they're still like, you know, hate each other going back for some time. But another kind of weird thing with the violence is um, you had, so in that port of Manzanillo, you got both the Sinaloa cartel and the Jalisco New Generation cartel operating. And they're both the biggest producers of fentanyl, of synthetic drugs. But a guy told me that actually the Sinaloa cartel is paying the new generation cartel for passage of its synthetics through Jalisco to Sinaloa. At a high level, they're working together to smuggle drugs. Even though the same cartels are fighting a full-on war over in Zacatecas, and even though they're lower down guys are fighting over like selling crystal meth at these like little selling points around the area. And it, it's kind of hard to get, you know, my, you know, your head around it. It's like you, you think about something for a long time, how come? But it's like they're, they're working in kind of weird ways. They can be conduct, conducting a war in one place, and then they can be like some guys can just sit down and do business. Okay, I want to transport a bunch of. Uh, a bunch of ingredients, a bunch of fentanyl through your territory, okay, this is how much it's going to cost. And they can make money. I mean, another, like another weird example of how this, this stuff goes on, I was talking to, I went to see the trial of El Chapo in New York. And his, the mortal enemy of Chapo had been Beltran Leva, this, this guy I mentioned before. El Chapo, Beltran Leva, it was a real hard rivalry. And I got to know the lawyers of El Chapo. And I said, uh, how did you get your case? And he said, uh, one of the Beltran Lever brothers introduced us to El Chapo. I thought these guys are maybe mortal enemies, but they're recommending lawyers to each other. So there's a, just a, it's just a weird thing when you try and get into this, like how it's really working at top levels and, and how there's money uh, being changed hands and, and people can still get on and cooperate and so forth, even when they kill each other and have wars with each other. I don't understand it at all. It's, it's, you know, when, when you look at the fentanyl crisis in the U.S. and all of the stuff that these guys control, and then you hear about, I mean, that, that sounds like a complete disaster, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. to be honest with you. But when you, when you, when you see that, it just, it shows you how inefficient the Mexican government is. It shows mm. how inefficient that the, U.S. border is, yeah, and and how inefficient the U.S. is at fighting this. Even Canada, you know what I mean. You have mm. you have organizations that are working together, who hate each other, who are killing each other. Nobody seems to get along, and they're still that successful. They're still making, yeah, you know, trillions of dollars by yeah. human trafficking, fentanyl, and 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 dozens of cartels, you know, yeah. and it it's it's. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, the amount of, it's like making all this money and at the same time, you know, you kill, you know, it's 35,000 murders in a year officially in Mexico. Um, and of those, we don't know exactly, it could be 70%, 75% uh, are cartel related in some way. So that many murders, that many of these guys being killed um, all the time, and yet they keep, it keeps on going. So yeah, it's it's kind of crazy how this this come this comes about and and how things have got this messed up. 
and, and yeah, I'm gonna say he's got to rethink. He's got to try and kind of figure out. Um, it, you know, this comes well at the time when politics is broken, so it's kind of frustrating because politicians are not really solving anything. They're not pragmatic about how do we try and this is a problem. How do we try and deal with it? Now, one thing, um, it's a different country, and something that I just went down to report on was in El Salvador with the gang situation. It might give a sense of how things might be in the future in Latin American countries. Hmm. So in El Salvador, they've had a real problem with gangs for decades, basically since the Civil War of El Salvador, which was 1980 to 1992. After that, you had a gang problem. It went from civil war to gangs, and it was connected. So you had guys coming back from the Civil War who were like veterans and, you know, you know either they fought in the guerrillas or they fought in the military. And what do we do now? We just join the gangs. And you had refugees who joined gangs up in Los Angeles and got deported and went down there. So you had these crazy gangs, incredible extortion, crazy murder. Now, they're not powerful, not the Mexican cartels. They don't have this kind of level of control. They're generally these kind of small neighborhood gangs, but they still manage to make most people pay extortion payments, and they're still carrying out a horrific level of murder. Now you've got this president called Nayib Bukele, who I interviewed in 2017. He became president 2019. 2019, he became president. Um, uh, and then he, last year, he, he's accused, and, and I believe this accusation, he first made a truce with the gangs to bring the murder rate down with plausible deniability over that truce. So you kind of had these kind of gangs who were still operating, but the murder level was down and they were kind of still around there. And at the same time, he's moving the military in and bolstering the military and so forth. Then in March 27th, 2021, he declared a state of emergency following a, the kind of breakdown of the truce, likely. And a sudden explosion of violence, he ordered a state of emergency. And he sent the military and the police into the neighborhoods and just did mass arrests. Between March and now, they arrested 64,000 people in a country of 6 million. It's about 1% of the population. It would be like in the United States in nine months detaining more than 3 million people. 3.3 million people. You imagine that in the United States. And he locked them up, talked to family members. They were like no communication with their, with their sons, husbands who were in prison. Didn't know if they were still alive. You know, mass incarceration. Very, very harsh. There's no way about, no two ways about it. Very, very harsh. However, the majority of people support it. The gangs have been decimated. Now, can they sustain that? Uh, I mean, obviously there's, there's people crying out, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, US Congress, you know, Congress representatives, you know, human rights disaster there. But it's been, it's decimated the gang structure. Hmm. So that might be the shape of the way things will go in Latin America, maybe in Mexico in the future you will get, you are seeing a bolstering of the military, like bigger, bigger bolstering of the military. Now Mexico's a messed up situation and the cartels are so strong and corruption is so deep, but that might be the way, whether we like it or not, that might be the future we're looking at. Interesting. More authoritarian governments. Yeah, that is uh, that's 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 interesting. When going back to the beheadings, you know, yeah. it was, it, they took a thing out of ISIS's, you know, playbook yeah. or Al Qaeda's or whoever they saw behead, um, and then it's and then it uh, you made it sound like it turned into a competition. Yeah. Between, is it? What's the point of the competition? Is it really just? I would say cartel you, leaders, yeah, no, chest pounding, wanting to be the most ruthless, or is there, is there a point to it other than ego, or is it just ego? Yeah, no, I would say there is. I would say there's a logic to it. So, like, if you're if you're a cartel, you know, you know, you you, you understand war and conflict. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, you know, Sean Ryan, you're given the job of being a cartel leader, controlling a chunk of Mexico, okay, and you've got. 50 guys under you in your particular territory. And you've got a rival cartel who's also trying to compete for that territory and you've got a civilian population and you've got military and you've got to deal with a bunch of stuff. 
So you're attacking their people. Now, you've got to send a message out to different people. You've got to send, like, terror out to anybody who betrays you or anyone who's opposing you. You know, we're going to not only kill you, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna terrify you. Mm-hmm. But also you're speaking to the young recruits. Who's the toughest cartel here? Who's going to win this turf battle? Do you want to join them or join us and look at us? We're on top. Oh, God. And you're sending a message out to informants, to, like, um, the population. Like, okay, I'm not going to snitch on these people. Now, if you look at, again, in the logical war, um, you know, you had in the Guatemalan civil war, trying to control, like, counterinsurgency tactics. How do we control a population? And, you, you know, you had some of this, there was uh, some, I mean, I looked at some of the counterinsurgency manuals in the School of the Americas. Some of the stuff taught by the United States to officers in these militaries who ended up defecting and joining cartels. Hmm. It's like, how do we control populations to get rid of an insurgency? So you've got, okay, a village, you've got insurgents in a village. Um, in Guatemala, okay, go in there, it was like, we've got to make sure none of you in the village will join the guerrillas. So we're going to behead people. You know, look at this, hang up, leave bodies, mm-hmm. terrorize the population to try and stop them joining the guerrilla force. And those tactics kind of, some of those tactics kind of bled through, kind of led into this weird hybrid conflict that we see today. Are they, are you seeing them, because you'd also said they do hu- kind of humanitarian work where they hand yeah. out free stuff. You know, do, are you seeing this stuff happen simultaneously where they instill fear and... Yeah. Try to win over the population with hearts and minds type yeah, operations. Yeah. yeah. yeah sim- happening simultaneously. Absolutely. Yeah, how absolutely. does the how does the civilian population respond to that? It, it's it's a mixed it's a mixed bag. Um you've got like you know, there's areas of Mexico where the where the, the these gangs are more deep rooted, like in the countryside of Sinaloa, where people have basically been kind of um, considered themselves in a way kind of more kind of bandit type territories for, for, for generations who don't really have much respect for the government in Culiacan or the government in Mexico City or Washington. It's all like faraway governments for them. They're kind of broken off and the cartels are like local power people. So for some of these people, especially if you're a young man in these places, it's like, okay, it's like I'm actually responding to the power and, and the government and I'm going to join that local militia. But then sometimes the cartels will have taken over new territories, um, particularly urban areas. They'll go into urban areas and then some of them will, they'll vary. Some of them will be more predatory and go in and be like, okay, we're going to go through and just start kidnapping, get a list of everybody. Who's got money in this town? Bang, kidnap, 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 kidnap. You know, make sure they've all got a house. And then, you know, everyone's going to hate them. But then a rival cartel will come in and say, okay, you know, you've been terrorized by this, these scumbags. We're going to come in and save you. And so then you see this kind of back and forth where these kind of like, some of these are called like self-defense squads, how to defense us, who then convert into cartels as well, kind of back and forth over these areas. Um, so, yeah, it's been like that shifting. I mean, you, you've seen about the, the, the self-defense forces, you seen some images of them. You had a bunch of, you know, sometimes we're like legitimate guys, lime farmers, who are like, we don't, we don't want to pay shakedowns to these cartels anymore, and we're kind of rise up, and you know, a bunch of us with guns, and we're going to fight the cartels ourselves, and then they kind of rise up, and it's kind of a nice story. But then you realise that some of these guys, who are meant to be the good guys, are also <laughs> damn, damn. <laughs> really traffickers. So, so, but I mean, Afghanistan's an interesting um, comparison. I mean, very, very different, but I think it's. In some ways, that kind of 21st century weird hybrid arm conflict, uh, and you see elements that you can compare. It is. I, I do think there's a high probability of that happening. If if we ever did declare that mm. a terrorist organization and foreign forces went in there, I could totally see in us fall for that again. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's it's yeah. Well, what's what do you got coming up next? Um, I got a bunch of I got a bunch of projects. Um, we got a uh, a trial, you know, very interesting trial of the former one of the former top officials in Mexico on trial for drug trafficking in the United States. 
So that would really look at the kind of official corruption. We had the trial of El Chapo, and that was like, you know, building up to the El Chapo trial. Um, it was kind of building up for years to kind of go after the ultimate kingpin. And then now we're going to go, they're kind of going after actually a, a corrupt official. Um, so that's going to be very interesting to see what comes out of that. Um, I've been looking at a, 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 a TV series based on one of the biggest US operations on a cartel over decades and kind of breaking it down, um, kind of getting with some of the players, um, both in the law enforcement side and in the cartel side and seeing really how that kind of played out. Oh, that'll be back and forth. When, yeah. When's that coming out? Yeah, we're still building that one up now, like developing the sources and developing that series, but that's something I'm working on hard. You think it'll be out this year? I mean, God willing, that'd be great if it is. But yeah, it, it, <laughs> All right. We'll see. It's, it's, it's a big project. It's a big yeah. project. It's like a, a like basically operation, like a task force, a US task force. Okay. And and we're kind of getting in with the, you know the big players they had and the whole judicial process and the protected witnesses and really kind of drilling down on that operation. And and still looking at stuff. I've been up on the the border a lot recently, uh, looking at some of the, uh, I mean, the asylum seekers. Uh, the smuggling gangs, you know, so we obviously had a, had a kind of uh, a lot of back and forth, a big hot political issue over the asylum seekers, which now it looks like the Biden administration is now going back to the, the Trump ideas of like uh, kicking asylum seekers back um, because the asylum system is basically collapsing because of the numbers. Interesting. Um, so basically what you have with that is you have uh, I mean, you've seen you've seen this increase over the years. So, like, see, what what it is is you have um, people arriving at the border and saying, "I'm going to claim political asylum in the United States." And more and more people have understood over the years that they can do this. You know, 20 years ago, people didn't really understand that you could go from a conflict in, you know, from violence in in whatever your country. You know, a lot of times they can be quite poor, uneducated people. Um, does this kind of run, run from the conflict? They're going to just come to the United States and just try and sneak over the border. But they realize there's kind of a lot of efforts by things like the uh, UN Refugee Agency, different groups to say you can ask for a political asylum. So people start to realize they can do this and they come and arrive at the US border and, and make an asylum claim. Now, I talk to a lot of these people on an individual basis and I'm sympathetic to their, their life stories. I mean, they've got brutal life stories, you know, many of them. They've been, you know, they, they, they've run from violence in Mexico, run from violence in Honduras, El Salvador, Brazil, Jamaica, uh, Venezuela, much of these countries. But because more and more people have been asking, the asylum system itself has basically collapsed. You got two million back cases. Wow, two million. Yeah, it's like nigh on two million back cases. A lot, a lot of them has really escalated the last couple of years. So then you start getting pushing back to like five year waiting lists to even see the case. So what a lot of what Trump was really doing, if you look at a lot of what Trump was doing on the border, a lot of the policy was really about trying to stop this rising, rising asylum cases. So he was trying to do this and was like, and then they, they, he'd get kicked back from the courts. So say, oh, you know, he'd say, oh, you, you know, I, I um, want to say you can't, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick you out uh, via, I'm going to use a pandemic measure to kick you out. Or I'm going to say you can't apply for asylum in the United States because you fled Honduras, so why didn't you apply for asylum in Guatemala or Mexico while you're applying here? Or, you know, trying to make, trying to change precedent to do this. Mm -hmm. I need to have kind of kick back from the courts and Biden came in and was like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to roll this back and we're not going to, we're going to get rid of all the, all, all what Trump was doing on the border. The reality, uh, and I think Biden is very evasive talking about this because Biden doesn't want to um, offend a base or offend the people who are saying we, we want asylum claims. But like what the uh, what the uh, Biden is doing really now is kind of going back to these same Trump Trump measures, looking for ways just to stop this without really changing the fundamentals, just looking for a way to stop people applying for asylum because the numbers are so big. Wow, I had no idea it was that yeah that big yeah. And a lot of what the back and forth I think is about right now. I mean, you got you still got the um, undocumented migrants coming over, mm -hmm. or, or, or the you know the the, the uh, undocumented migrants, illegal immigrants. You know, we can talk about the language, 
But like, um, we still got a lot of people going over who want to just, you know, pay smugglers, get through the border work. But what's really changed in the real big crisis, I think a lot of this back and forth is about that. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, a, a complicated issue. I don't think really the, um, it's come across clearly what that debate's about, maybe in a lot of the reports, particularly because um, the language, like, you know, Biden, they don't want to really explain explain that. Mm-hmm. Um because they don't, they want to kind of don't want to, but they, they, re, I think they understand practically that that the U.S. is not going to receive this amount of asylum claims. Wow, what? <laughs> yeah. Oh man, what? What else do you got coming? That's a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, uh, plenty more stuff. So I've been, I've been. Um, Working a lot on a, on a on a sub stack on doing a lot of my own stories over the years. I've been working a lot for for big meter outlets, Time Magazine, New York Times. Um, but I've got a lot on uh, doing a lot of my own own material on this on this sub stack. I'm gonna link your sub stack yeah. in the in the description. So appreciate. It. Yes, It'll also I'm, be in the newsletter and yeah. all the other media that we have. So yeah, I got I got a bunch more stories on that coming. I've I've already done like a bunch of stories then on on all this fentanyl, um, migrant smugglers. Asylum, um, the Obidio Guzman, the, the, the Sinaloa cartel stuff. I got some more stories coming up. I got some stories about pirates in the Gulf really? of Mexico. In the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, I just I've already done the research on that story. I'm going to write that up. Basically, it's some uh, um, a, a bunch of. I mean, it's kind of cra- one of these crazy side stories. A bunch of uh, um, oil installations there. Um, there's there's pirates robbing oil installations. What they'll do is they'll often go onto these oil rigs, oil platforms, and there'll only be like six of these guys, but they're you know six guys with AK-47s, and they'll steal a bunch of the oxygen gear, which is this like quite high expensive, high end oxygen gear, which are worth you know several thousand dollars each one. These kind of uh, they call them autonomous. Oxygen equipment, mm-hmm. and they'll they'll steal like a hundred packs of this um, and make away. And I talked to one guy who was who was on one of these oil rigs when it happened, and they started having a. There was a couple of marines there on the oil rig, but most of the marines would take forty five minutes to get there from a different place. So these guys knew they had like twenty minutes basically. Um, so they did it, did the robbery, got away, and they've been doing that a bunch of times. They've always been robbing the fishermen, and the Mexican government's basically hushing a lot of this up because it's kind of bad publicity. Mm-hmm. So the Mexican oil company as well was kind of, you know, wouldn't let the, the workers talk about this. Um, so that's one, one, one crazy story. Um, another one uh, about to publish, uh, which I was mentioning to you about, was about a bunch of um, uh, healers with, with psychedelics. Uh, Ayotzinapa have been arrested in Mexico. You know, while all this fentanyl's coming through, they're arresting these guys with psychedelic sites in uh, ayahuasca. Put them, ayahuasca. They're, they're arresting them with ayahuasca and uh, and uh, threatening them with hard prison time. Um, uh, and looking at that as well, I went to visit a guy in prison, a, a, a healer from Peru, in prison with ayahuasca. What a shame! Yeah. Yeah, all this is going on, and the, mm. and they're going to arrest somebody for. Uh, for healing mm. with uh, ayahuasca. What a shame. But, well, I just want to say I really appreciate you coming here. All your links, all your social media, everything will be linked in the description. And, um, man, thank you for coming out. I hope to see you again. Thanks for taking the time. Great to be here. And, yeah, great to talk to you and your, and your audience. Great to see this great uh, great operation and talk about these issues. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, man. Thank you. You too. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.